Okay, uh, seeing a presence of a quorum, call the meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.04 p.m. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the last meeting of the year, school year, for mm -hmm. Amherst School Committee, so it's a big deal. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the first order of business is to approve our school committee meet minutes of November 27th. And um, I'll take a motion. I move Jackson. the approval of the minutes of the Amherst School Committee at November 27th, 2018. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Dumling. Um, give the committee a moment to review the minutes, if they haven't already done so. <clears throat> Mr. Dumling. I, I, I feel like I always need to remind the public that we get these electronically a few days ahead of time. So we have, we have plenty of time to review them. And I, so when, I, when I first watched the school committee meeting, I was like, how can you approve them this? <laughs> I was like, oh, you've seen them before, okay. There's always the last minute, uh, you know, glance yes, through that people yes. do, yes. So if there are no edits, um, is the committee ready for a vote? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. And we have three in favor um, and one abstention. abstention? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on, we have announcements. Are there any announcements uh, from the committee before we go to public comment? No announcements. All right. So we will move to public comment. If anyone uh, in the public would like to make a comment, please come up to the microphone and state your name. You have three minutes. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to comment. My name is Johanna Newman. I live at 137 Stanley Street, um, which is in District 2. And um, I have two kids at Fort River Elementary School, a kindergartner and a second grader. Um, and I guess I'm here to share three core thoughts. The first is that you know, in the wake of the previous building project not coming through, we now have really clear numbers about what it's going to cost both to renovate the school that my kids are in, what it would take to actually, so that it's, you know, kind of doesn't rain into the school and we can turn on heaters safely. And that cost is $29 million just to make those renovations. Um, replacing the school is going to cost 46 to $64 million, and that's just for Fort River. So... You know, I just find the costs associated with getting our kids into quality learning environments staggering, and I don't know how Amherst is going to deal with that, and I thank you for your attentiveness in dealing with this issue, but um, I'm also here to just urge you to come up with an interim plan, because as you know, the Massachusetts State Building Authority didn't let us into their process again this year for a building. So now, based on, I believe, Mr. Morris's estimates, the earliest we get our kids, if we do two separate buildings, the absolute earliest we would get quality schools for our kids is 2033. I don't think Fort River or Wildwood are going to last that long, and so we actually need an interim solution while we come up with a longer-term plan. And I want to urge you to move forward that interim solution, um, start getting community involvement around it um, so that you know we can move forward together. Um, and then obviously I think we just need to keep the pedal to the metal on you know, the actual underlying infrastructure problems we face, which is you know we need new schools and I can't imagine Amherst being able to fund anything other than a co-located building within the time frame that we need. Um, thanks for the time. Thank you. Um, so my name is Virginia Wardlaw. I am an ARH student, and my address is 57 Amherst Road in Pelham, Massachusetts. So as you know, recently there was an act of anti-Semitism at the school we're in right now, um, where a swastika was put on the back of a student's backpack. And... Recently, we found that you guys, not you, but the school hasn't been giving um, Jewish students a voice in the matter. And I understand that after school, there's going to be a meeting where we're allowed to talk about it. But I feel as if it should be 
required, I don't know if there's going to be an advisory plan, but I want to know how, as a community, we can give Jewish students a voice and allow them to maybe take the lead in some of the conversations. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so that was a, just a reminder that the, this committee deals with uh, primarily the elementary schools um, in, in here in Amherst, but I think we can certainly take these comments to the meeting of the regional school committee, which is, um, our next meeting is January, sorry, Dr. Morris. 15th, I think. 15th, I believe. Um, so we'll take these comments there, and these become part of the public record. So thank you. Any other public comments? Hi, I'm Deb Leonard. Um, I live on uh, Old Farm Road. I have three students in the uh, Parmer Amherst Regional Home School District. I have one at Fort River and two here at the high school. One's currently playing basketball over there. Um, it was 17-2 when I left, so we were doing well. Uh, um, so, I'm, I'm, as many of you are and many of the communities, I'm, I'm really uh, spinning about the numbers that I've been hearing lately. The, certainly the $12.4 million in repairs to buildings that are at the end of their lifetimes. <laughs> Another $29 million just to bring Fort Mer River alone up to code. Um, the previous uh, study from Wildwood was $20 million for Wildwood. These numbers are staggering and um, with no MSBA funding for 2019, I guess what I'm asking is for a plan to make a plan going forward. I mean, the, the plea has gone out and, and been heard that we should stop rehashing the past, <laughs> which is easy to do when we have something to do with this energy, the, this concern, with this sense of urgency that we feel as a community for the needs, the academic needs, the equity needs in the face of the fiscal realities of our town. So I think the community can come together and work together, but there's nothing to do right now except just keep going back. It's like balancing your checkbook. You keep going back and saying, the money's not there. What are we gonna do? The money's not there. What are we gonna do? So please, <laughs> thank you for your part in all of this, but, but please think about ways that we can think about moving forward and formulating plans for fixing this really awful situation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, closing public comments. So moving on to uh, superintendent's update. Dr. Sure. Morris. And I'll keep it brief. Um, so we've talked in multiple committees about the diversity teacher workforce grant that um, in an effort to increase the diversity of our staff with current paraeducators, there's now a website which is listed on the sheet um, and one of our paraeducators is featured on the home page um, so it's again trying to publicize uh, the work that four districts the Amherst public Amherst our districts combined as one Holyoke Public Schools Springfield Public Schools and um, the Northampton Public Schools are working together on this front along with five colleges Inc uh, tomorrow morning uh, there's several staff members really staff across the <coughs> elementary district who are visiting a school in East Longmeadow that successfully implement a breakfast after the bell program. And the short story of breakfast after the bell is that we know some of our students aren't having breakfast at home and then based on a whole range of factors aren't having breakfast when they come to school. Um, so a school in East Longmeadow has it up and running and is a model school. So Desi is actually gonna be there as well, I think as listed uh, below. And so we have a team including custodian, classroom teacher, um, administrators and food service staff attending that and when we come back in January with the food service update that was one of the budget um, guidance questions we'll be able to include some thoughts on this but we, we were originally scheduled for tonight but it felt like when I talked to Miss um, Palmer the food service director it'd be really odd to have the conversation about budget guidance before this is a major exploration so we push it to next month um, our preschool again is working with multiple other preschools on the period model to better meet student needs um, 
And what was nice, we put this in the Friday newsletter and actually a community member reached out and said, oh, I'm actually working on a similar project in another community and is now connected with our preschool coordinator. So um, really nice that it's not just us, but there's actually multiple preschools across the Commonwealth working on it. And I think the last thing I'll mention is that, um, and uh, school member, you know, Ms. Ordenes, you can share as well. Um, last week, Fort River hosted a meeting for current Fort River Latino families to hear about their experiences to help not just inform the dual language program, but get feedback on the school, how, people, how families experience the school more generally. We were happy with the attendance, um, and a lot of good feedback was gathered, and the idea is to how can we make this group kind of an advisory group moving forward. Um, I'll talk about a little more impl implications for dual language programming when we get to that agenda item, but I thought it was good, it was worth mentioning at this point as well. I don't know if you have things that you'd like to add to that. Yeah, um, I, I'll just say that I <clears throat> had received a phone call from uh, one of the coordinators of this program uh, a week prior to the actual meeting taking place and was thrilled to get the phone call. Um, and uh, the call was entirely in Spanish, which was completely appropriate given the target uh, demographic, the target audience. And um, the idea really for, it, it goes beyond getting feedback for the dual lo language program, it's actually about uh, <coughs> encouraging participation yeah. and volunteering uh, and involvement in Fort River School, which is fantastic for Latino families who don't typically um, get a say in that way or you know, aren't necessarily uh, sort of solicited, I guess, to, to participate in that way. Yeah. It was really exciting, and there, there was good turnout, as you mentioned. Um, the, again, the, the, the meeting was held in, almost entirely in Spanish. Um, people seemed very excited to be there. There was some food, and um, the, you know, the general environment was actually really congenial. So it was great. I'm really happy to see the school moving forward in this way and inviting the community to come in, you know, sort of open the doors wide for, for these families. I think it made a huge difference. People felt really good. There were a lot of smiles. Yeah. Um, and a lot of attention being placed. So, yeah, it was great to be there. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Uh, so, moving along, um, the first item of business is uh, Cambodian Artifacts Gift to the Jones Library Collections. And Dr. Morris, I'll let you <coughs> help explain what this is all about. Sure. So I'm um, just going to show some images uh, up above, but um, there's a memo in the packet that explains it a bit, that we've had a long relationship with the, the schools, have had a long relationship with the Cambodian community all the way back from the, when the refugee project started uh, many, many years ago. And Fort River has, a, I think, you know, having taught there, a special, collection, a special connection, I think, with the Cambodian community. Not that the other schools don't, but historically, there was a larger presence at Fort River than the other elementary schools. And Fort River has a collection of materials, and we want to make sure they're preserved. And what we all know about, you know, schools is there's a lot of kids there. And sometimes that works, that's what we do. And the other thought is, in terms of preservation, it's not always the best environment uh, for materials. And so I'm going to try to do double duty and speak while I um, show some of the materials that are here. You can see the do not touch signs outside the library, you know, so um, students are wonderful, but we don't have a lot of closed spaces uh, for storage at Fort River. Um, and I'm fast forwarding a little bit because I want to get beyond um, some of the great pictures of students just to show the types of materials that these are. We've used them for educational purposes in the past. They tend to be rather delicate. Um, Items. Some of them, again, are photos of the history of the refugee experience in Amherst, um, original stories that go way back. Um, and so the Fort River staff um, came to me, many of the, a couple of the Fort River staff members, as well as a UMass professor, Richard Chu, who's been leading a group, um, a community group um, that includes staff members, to talk about um, how we can continue to best support the Cambodian community in Amherst multiple generations after their arrival. Um, and what the recommendation from that group, which I'm bringing to, to this body, is to deed our collection to the Jones Library. Um, in a second, I'll invite someone, a representative from the Jones to speak to that. Um, so we'd be giving up kind of quote unquote ownership uh, and permanently gifting the materials. For, um, for us, it's a way to preserve the history uh, in a way that we still could have access to. The Jones is down the road. All of our students visit the Jones every year. But it's not just the school history, it's actually part of Amherst history. And that was really the, the key principle uh, about wanting to gift it to the Jones. We feel like we have this treasure trove of materials that um, we would like the whole town to have access to because it's such an integral part of the town of Amherst. 
So Cindy, I don't know if you would like to come up. So um, Cindy Harberson from the Jones Library, yeah, you can join me here, um, is going to speak a little bit to the connection and what would happen at the Jones Library with the materials if they were, um, if you support them being gifted. Great, welcome. Um, so we have a small collection of uh, Cambodian related materials that date back to um, the 1980s. Our ESL program was established as a response to the um, need for adults to have some um, English as a second language um, uh, instruction and, um, and so there was a lot of support there for, um, for that project which still um, continues and flourishes today. Um, and so then the special collection seemed like uh, in meetings with um, uh, Tori Weed and um, Fran Luddington. Luddington, thank you, um, that it would be a good connection to have the materials there. Right now they're on carts in um, the library sort of tucked to the side and there was worries from the staff as they're retiring, the people who were closely involved with the project are retiring that the materials might get lost. Um, and so special collections is, um, that's what we do is house uh, and preserve important items like this. So um, we think it would be a great fit. Everybody in the community would have access to it. Um, they met over several months with um, community members and, and they were all very enthusiastic about having um, the collection come uh, to the Jones. Um, so that's, uh, and we would, make it available and there'd be a, you know, finding aid for it and everybody who wanted to, to see it would have access to it as they do to all of our uh, collections. Um, so that's my, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. So does the committee have any questions um, for our guest or Mr. Finley? Has, has anyone in the community expressed any objection to this move? I mean, it seems like a really, like you said, a great fit. But it seems like a very high level of community support. Uh, from my, from not me. not for me. Uh, everybody I've talked to is really my uh, Sharon Sherry, the director, is very excited about having the collection there. Uh, Lynn Weintraub, who does the ESL program, put me in touch with Tori, and um, so people seem really really excited about it. I haven't had anybody, um, to me personally, express any any problem with it. But and the same on the school side is that this really came from staff who are deeply connected and committed, and some of them really uh, connected from the first immigration. <coughs> movement happen of Cambodian families to, to our community and I think they're just at a place of these materials are getting older, there's no great, as I mentioned, there's no great storage place and you know for us it's actually a great, you know, and I'm not sure how much of the conversation you've been in but just to have students realize that the library, the town libraries are places that the town's history goes to be um, connected and is accessible is a really great lesson because for young students they don't, they think of libraries as books, right, mm -hmm. which is not that that's not true, but um, that the special collections is actually a wonderful place where you can find out many, many more things and, and not just the books that you want to read and bring home and read uh, on your own or with your families, but actually there's so much of the town history that is um, that is connected and, and literally at the Jones. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I was just wondering whether the materials are, are well documented now in terms of what everything is and where it came from and what the special history behind it is, or if that's something that might happen in a more, whether it's well organized now, or whether one of the benefits of this is it might be better organized if you were housing the Jones had the collection. Uh, so I looked through the materials, I've seen them once, um, and in my mind they're not really well organized, so I think that this would uh, be a good opportunity. Um, both uh, the people, of Fran and Tori, were very interested in continuing to work with me on, on doing that sort of uh, you know, adding the information about where the materials came from and um, and making sure that that's documented. So I think it would be a, a project um, going forward to make sure that that um, is done and just sort of putting like things together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> just a, a quick question. Um, are there plans um, in place or in the works potentially to encourage access of the elementary um, school students to this collection once it's, if it does move to the Jones? Um, Tori and I spoke briefly today. We were having trouble 
connecting because I was sick and we had to cancel and um, then her daughter was sick today. So um, I don't have details, but we talked briefly about um, plans in the future to do some community outreach event and also um, with the students sort of showing them that it's being transferred and that sort of thing. So I think it's in the works, but I don't have details. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I uh, was. I think it sounds great. I mean, I, I appreciate also the ability to catalog the items and to you know uh, provide proper storage uh, for them. It sounds like you know this is a really valuable resource for the community. So thank you for thinking about this and, and making them room for it. Uh, what I am wondering though, if there's any way to, to actually create uh, some sort of leave behind, I guess, at Fort River. Uh, whether it's a poster or a, one of the items, you know, that with a note of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. So that students and, and teachers and parents, you know, family members can see that there was some sort of history there, and and you know, and even provide some direction to go to the Jones Library if you want to mm -hmm. see more you know, materials from them. And it can even be something that can circulate out on you know on a regular basis or semi regular basis. I don't know. But just a, a way of uh, providing that link between Fort River and Jones, you know, and, and so maybe the same thing could also happen at Jones, where you could say, you know, some sort of thank you to the Fort River community for doing that. But just, to, I think, it strikes me that for students, especially and for families um, with uh, Cambodian heritage that have come through Fort River, if they visit the school, that there should be something there mm -hmm. that says, you know, we, we acknowledge, uh, I think of the mural that's out here, you yeah. know, in the hallway here at the high school, um, just a way of acknowledging the, the contributions of that community to that, that particular school. Do you want me to? Yeah. So I, I think it's a great idea, and I think the thing to note is these materials aren't, like, readily accessible during the school day. So mm -hmm. um, I think if there was some way we could think about sharing um, you know, whether it's a plaque or some note that actually is more visible than the materials are now mm -hmm. uh, about that. I think it's something that, you know, yourself, myself, Sharon, we can figure out. I think it's a great suggestion because actually we'll highlight, even though the materials literally won't be there, it'll highlight them more than how they, where they currently are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. We'll do that. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Um, so there is a motion. Um, uh, if, and I'll take a motion. Mr. Nakajima, do you want to read sure. that? Sure. I uh, move uh, the Amherst School Committee um, adopt the following motion. Move to permanently gift the collection of Cambodian materials currently housed at Fort River Elementary School to the Jones Library for archiving in their special collections. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? The only, only comment I'd make is um, having toured the Jones thoroughly, I don't know, half a year ago or more. Um, I love I loved the special collections, and I thought a number of them are really remarkable. What they also are is they're largely oriented towards our town's wonderful uh, literary and agricultural heritage, which is phenomenally white. Uh, and it's, it's a funny thing. I mean, because by the way, this was happening when I was a kid in our schools. So it's sort of like a weird thing to like think that stuff that you remember and experienced around you and is like an important part of our community on a very sort of day-to-day, -day, I mean, I hate to say it, but very much like the students who were earlier talking about negative incidents in the high school, that's part of our lived experience, right? And it's, it, it can feel mundane or it can feel very personal to people, but it's also our town's history. It's who we are and who we become. And so I think the idea of the Jones not only protecting the materials, but also finding ways to include it so that when people look at the narrative story of our town, it includes all of its dimensions, including the wonderful uh, contribution um, as well as experience, lived experience of the Cambodian communities is wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Nashio. Yeah. Okay, um, so are we ready to take a vote? All those in favor of the motion as put forth, please signify by raising your hand. It passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. <laughs>
and just to, you know, the goal of this update is just to orient the committee where the feasibility committee is in process. So it was the first opportunity to look at cost, initial cost estimates that were draft. Um, they're getting revised. We have another meeting on Thursday morning at 9.30. Yeah, and yeah, that's really only the first revision. I'm sure that coming out of that meeting will be more. Yeah, um, but it, it was good to see a first draft. Some of the topics that came up and were discussed were uh, not just the net zero bylaw, but the spirit of the net zero bylaw, and, and whether that spirit included, you know, how many PVs, not in a literal sense, but in a figurative sense, are consistent, or is it really the building envelope and the heating source that contributes to that? So we had, I think, a robust conversation about you know, implications of net zero. Yeah, and actually, if I can add please, to yeah, that, please. I'm just going to I'll give only a little bit of color to that because I think it's, it's useful. From a cost perspective, one of the things the designers were saying is that the cost of um, photovoltaic panels has gone down so much over the last few years that if you literally want to build uh, a net zero energy elementary school, and let's say for the sake of argument you have lots of land, you could put solar panels on it that you already own. Um, you could you could create a zero energy building without adopting the kind of forward thinking uh, building design or materials that you might have looked to do um, in the or not it might have been necessitated to do in the past um, and then so the question that came up uh, which was also raised by a member of the public who attended was is the spirit of the bylaw that it's pure and simple zero energy in which case there are cheaper ways you can do it, where essentially you might have, I hate to call it a leaky building because it's not literally true, yeah, right. but the point is not as state-of-the-art tight a building, which would be more expensive, but you just put up more solar panels to offset it, or is the spirit of the enterprise that, no, 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 no. we're going to be a forward-looking community that adopts, you know, if not state-of-the-art designs, ones that are really pushing um, where our community should be in terms of energy efficiency, and uh, not adopting sort of the photovoltaic analogy to saying if oil is only 35 cents a gallon, why not just put in a bunch of oil burners and don't worry about insulation on your building envelope, which would be the analogy from 50 years ago. And, and I'm sorry, and there's cost implications to doing that, right? So you could have a more expensive looking design because theoretically you're saying, let's do something that pushes or adopts the state of the art as opposed to doing something that's cheaper on paper that says, well, it is zero energy, but it's honestly, the building is like any other building that's designed that's not zero energy. Um, and uh, uh, I think you were actually somebody who gave this feedback. The, uh, the, 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 the committee, even though it understood that this made for a more expensive sticker price on paper for a study, which is all this is, um, we adopted the more expensive sticker price because we felt like saying to the community we were going to pick um, a, we were not going to try to adopt the state of the art around zero energy in terms of building design and the building envelope didn't seem to fully comport with the spirit of the bylaw the town had adopted. But, and also the other point is, if that's the most expensive it gets, then if the town, whenever it decides or the committee decides to move forward with the building, if you want to pick something cheaper, pick something cheaper. Mm -hmm. But you'll know what you'll know what the choices are. Yeah, Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And that was really a little window <laughs> into the discussion. Yeah, and I think the framing that 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 I'll say I personally had at the meeting was um, twofold. One was understanding the net zero implications of all the models, not just new construction, because it's really important uh, when we're looking at ad reno that the ad part of it has to be net zero. And there was a lot of focus on it on the new construction, and you know, in my perception. It wasn't as well defined on the ad reno models, and what do we? And someone else raised, what do we do I'm on sorry, the Morris, Can you please? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Just clarify yeah. what um, that means. Addition <laughs> renovation <laughs> model. No, no, sorry. Uh, but let me clarify this. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this at the last meeting, but I don't think we went into it in much depth. Is that if you, the portions of the building that are being renovated, everything's subject to the zero energy bylaw, but the portions that are new construction have to be constructed so as to be zero, uh, net zero. Uh, the portions that are being renovated but not replaced do not have to be net zero. They can be more efficient, but they don't have to be net zero. Um, so it, my, my comment was actually about the ad reno yeah. comment, right? Because it's uh, addition renovation. Yes. Oh, so yeah, I, yeah. Just wanted, I just wanted to clarify that for the community in case somebody's listening and wondering, what does reno yeah. mean exactly? So I backed yeah. up too far. <laughs> Renault is not a name but of a car, not of a real brand. It is renovation. Um, 
<laughs> anyway, so the point the point of it is though is that in, I think this is the point that the superintendent was making at a meeting at, at the meeting and today, which was was useful, was the the designers weren't really providing feedback. They were and they weren't. They they provided like a table that showed the relative building efficiency of of different um, forms of construction, but it was really vague what that really meant. Like, how do you translate that into so you're going to jump in. And oh, okay. <laughs> sure. So, um, so I want to, you know, I guess my, the way I'd say it is I wanted apples to apples comparison of yeah. the energy usage and consumption um, of all the different models. Because, you know, at this point, kind of think consistent with the language of town meeting and the school committee, the, the goal of the feasibility committee is to present multiple options and give as much data to the committees and the community as we can and so anytime there's one model that has significantly more presented data, I'm not saying there's not actual data, but it's mm -hmm. significantly more presented data, reasonable people could come to the conclusion that, oh, that's the one that is the preferred one by some group. And, and that's not how the feasibility committee has structured itself. It's not how uh, I think the school committee has structured that the dialogue right. that happened here. And we want that reflected in the presentation materials. Right. And the, the other thing, since people are talking about the numbers, um, the numbers are estimated as of um, 2020 or 2021? Fall 2020, yeah. Fall 2020. So it includes 8% inflation put upon their baseline um, cost estimate. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other numbers in there are being subject of some debate. Like, you know, if you have soft costs, do you, is it? 25%, is it 22%, is it 30%? Um, but the reason I'm saying that is only because how you how you pick or justify those percentages based on the professional judgment of the designers can add or remove millions of dollars of cost that are basically just being, I mean, I don't want to be, I'm not diminishing it, but it's based on a judgment, right? In the same way that if you inflate the construction cost by 8% to fall of 2020, um, if inflation goes out of control, guess what? It's going up from there. If inflation is significantly below that, because there's particularly construction uh, inflation, then it's going to be below that. Um, in that sense, their estimates, and one of the things that the designers said that they were trying to build into their work was go, being very conservative on their on the numbers they were using or the percentages. And by conservative, I mean, in this case, erring on the side of it being too much money, not too little money um, put into it. So um, their hope was that if the numbers look high, that's because it ideally would not go likely higher than that. If anything, it might be lower than that. Is that right? Yep. I Anyways, think that's. The and so, and good. so the the committee also discussed trying to provide whatever feedback to the. I mean, this isn't a decision, right. but it's just literally the conversation. Um, as soon as possible, so that by the middle or, or late January, there might be um, numbers that were more sort of locked down in terms of a deliverable that could be then brought back to this committee and the public more general. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The only other thing I'd add, which is this, uh, on the agenda topic was slightly different, um, slightly tangential to this conversation was um, there's a group that will form that was identified to work on community outreach and, you know, when's a good time to have forums and how do we, you know, present the material. So um, I think that group probably will you know, get going likely after the holiday to look at the multiple events that are happening across our district in January. Try not to double book where people have to make a choice between high school musical and and uh, learning more about the feasibility. So there'll be more to share at our the next Amherst School Committee meeting on that topic, but it's certainly on the feasibility committee's mind that we're getting pretty close to needing to take this show on the road and, and get some feedback from the larger community as well. That's great. Um, okay, so... I'm looking to the, the committee to see if there are any uh, questions or comments. Um, Mr. Dunling. Yeah, so, um, no, I mean, first I just want to thank the volunteer unpaid Fort River Feasibility <laughs> Committee for having gotten us to this point. And this is exactly the kind of thing, deliverable, we were looking for when we talked about this oh so many moons ago. So, you know, it's I think it's good to acknowledge that, that level of progress and success. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, one... You know, one, one sort of concern I have, and it's not really concern as, mu as much as it's something to, for us to just to be aware of and, and put a final point on. Mr. Nakajima brought this point up, is, is that these, these are initial draft 
numbers that the I, the committee really hasn't had a chance to the, the feasibility committee hasn't had a chance to go all the way through yet. And I'm sure and you, you know, you've already brought up a number of questions about net zero and other cost assumptions and inflation and what you know to what degree does the site impact it and what are those variables. So um, like this is obviously very interesting and um, it's gotten a lot of attention in our community. And, and while I don't expect the numbers to be off by orders of magnitude, <laughs> um, who knows uh, how they'll be adjusted. And so, um, it, you know, it's, it's hard to look at it and then not unsee, and then unsee it. <laughs> so it obviously informs, like, my general thinking, right? Like, so we're, and we have time-sensitive things we have to talk about. We have the statement of interest response coming up, which is, you know, uh, related to this whole general topic of the future of the buildings. Um, so it's hard for me not to think of this in that context, but, but I, I do want to sort of, give, uh, uh, make sure that we as the school committee, you know, uh, guide the public in giving the feasibility committee the time it needs to, to deliberate and, and make its way through the numbers. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point and well, and well taken and, and thank Mr. Demlin. I guess it's sitting as I sit on that committee and this committee. Um, <laughs> for, for, the, for the comment, um, uh, particularly because, I mean, it's, it's one of those funny things. It's just, it, we're, subject to open meeting law, right? So all, and we should be, and so all the materials should be transparent, but what it means is all the points at which the consultants are thinking out loud and coming up with scenarios and looking for feedback to adjust their work, they're doing in a public forum where all the materials become public, and so uh, that's just the way it is, and so you roll with it, and um, you can't unsee something you've seen <laughs> as, you, as you comment. But, we're the, but the point is also, I think, the conversation as we move forward is going to become even, even more detailed in terms of why things are done a certain, why they're doing some, putting forward things a certain way. And I think that's going to be helpful to the community, and I think it's actually constructive to our conversation. I mean, the reality is um, construction only gets more expensive. So the idea that something is more expensive than it was two years ago it will be more expensive two years from now, it will be more expensive four years from now, is um, barring, by the way, a Great Depression. Because as it turns out, if you have like a really, really, really big recession, then sometimes things actually do get cheaper. Uh, like I remember the second time I went to Japan, uh, food after the Great Recession there, food and hotels were actually literally cheaper in Japan the second time, and it had been like 12 years later. And I was like freaked out. Um, but that's like a, I mean, not trying to, I'm not trying to sound silly about this. Cause that's literally like 1930s stuff. It's like worst case scenario. But um, so my point is that's the environment we're living in where I think whatever the numbers end up being, things are going to be more expensive five years from now than they are today. And we're going to have to, it, it, it's a normative, has a normative impact on the decisions we make as a community. So yeah, I just want to say, you know, I mean, I appreciate that we're seeing drafts early and that the public is seeing drafts early. Like, it, it is a higher socialization challenge and a communication challenge because it's, it's, this is the in-draft process as people are working through and asking questions, but, but, but that's, that's what you get with, with higher transparency. You know, you get, this, this, this to me is preferable than, than seeing nothing and then at the very end seeing a completely prepackaged final deal. You know, I mean, we, we have the same exact theme on um, Regional School District Planning Board, you know, where we're, you know, we get worried about the public perceiving that we're going in a certain direction, but that's that's how the sausage is made, and the public should be able to see how that's all happening. And draft documents by consultants is something we deal with as well. So it's, uh, you know, I, I appreciate this level of, of uh, transparency. I would I would second that. I mean, I think from my perspective, <coughs> um, it's helpful to know that this is a work in progress, and that this information mm -hmm. is still being developed, and that there's feedback that's available, you know, that that can be made available from the community and from the committee, and um, and that this will continue to be uh, fine-tuned, I guess. Um, that said, I, I do think that it's important to contextualize some of this information, and so, you know, that the numbers do feel uh, so much higher than what you know perhaps some community members were expecting previously, right? Based on our prior experience with another project, um, these numbers, you know, the, 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 I guess the cost has increased so much faster, perhaps, and than a lot of folks, you know, believe that that could, that could happen. And even though there had been previous, uh, you know, conversations around the increase in cost, annual cost for these kinds of projects, to see it on paper 
and maybe not have the you know complete context of like how it is how is this a relative to other projects for example you know do you see typically this kind of cost increase year per year and I'm looking I guess to the both yeah. of you having sat on this committee and having those conversations with the designers to help shed some light on that right because I think that that's part of what's missing around mm -hmm. the community conversation with this you know the numbers feel so much higher that some folks will react with skepticism around it and others just feel like wow like this is you know how do we how do we deal with this right so you know have you talked about that is there a rationale for it have, you know and, and to what degree have you really bored like drilled down to understand you know what, what accounts for this literally? well one of the one of the things actually that the feasibility committee asked for <clears throat> for uh, next iteration is actually more benchmarking against other projects to understand how this project compares I mean, we would have been happy to have gotten that and then it'd be in your your packet but since they put together the materials and presented it to us mm -hmm. that was a question that came out of it so one of the questions is going to be how does it compare um, uh, I'll let I mean I'll let superintendent jump in but my understanding is that the site costs are higher um, than or the site costs are high but maybe higher than they would be at a different location in town and um, at least on the margins, the zero energy adds some cost to the project as well. Um, don't forget also, everything you're seeing has that 8% inflation adjustment out two years into the future, back to, you know, tacked onto it. So you have to back that out. You'd have to back that out to see what the present cost would be. Yeah, um, I think I'll speak a little more about this in the next agenda <laughs> item, so I don't want to have a awkward segue. That's not my goal but I think uh, I still have questions that I know will come up yeah. on Thursday so um, I don't feel great about response I have the same questions that you raised um, I don't feel like I'm resolved with um, I do think to Mr. Nakajima's point about cost um, escalation if you think about people comparing to a prior project this is a project in the future that was a project that would have been in the past so the escalation is it's more than just two years yeah, it's yeah, actually yeah, yeah, that's right. it's actually it's multiple like years. Four or five years right and so just you, you think of cost escalation at three or four percent times three or four years that's a lot of money um and when you're talking about millions of dollars to begin with so i, I think you have a pretty tight construction market right now too yeah i mean it, there, it's a I'm seeing nodding over there someone who knows <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um particularly all over the northeast particularly in massachusetts we continue to to see that and hear that um just it's really hard to get subcontractors and folks that do it there's uh, there's enough private building also which is um, a little easier facilitated uh, for a lot of people who work in the trades because there's less hoops to go through and um, so I'll talk about this a bit more perhaps in the next agenda item but I think in terms of the questions you know about site about net zero about why the cost would be you know what the escalation and how do we end up at numbers that are higher than typical again um, I think at the next meeting I'll come back with a little more clarity and I'll share a little more at the next agenda. Item. Yeah, and it's yeah. not, my question wasn't intended to have, you know, the two of you come yeah. up with the answer. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, it's a very complicated uh, question. But I do think that it's important, again, to contextualize it just, you know, in, in terms of helping the community understand. Mm -hmm. Um, and if the if the building <coughs> committee is going to be sharing that information out to right. make sure that that is a part of that conversation, you know, and, and that there are, uh, you know, that the rationale is given consistently for why those those costs yeah. continue to increase. I mean, I've heard you know materials costs are increasing, mm -hmm. uh, concrete the price of concrete and steel, for example, you know, with the shortages that have happened, just you know, uh, just. Constant, constant surplus attitude, <coughs> and then the labor shortage, and yeah. so we're mm -hmm. paying more for for labor and and competing with a lot of other uh, a lot of other developments. Right? Are there any other questions or comments from the committee on this particular topic, oh. Ms. Spitzer? I'm just curious. Now that we have the the town council formed and, and inaugurated, sadly I missed the inauguration. But um, how have, have we been communicating between the Fort River Feasibility Committee and with it? any or all members of the town council at all. Just thinking about feasibility, not just in terms of the site feasibility and the feasibility of what we can build there, but the feasibility in terms of <coughs> getting not only the community invested in this, but uh, town council, since they're the ones who are also going to be involved in this process. So I know that at the last meeting last week, there was a discussion of the feasibility committee about trying to get on the town council's agenda. Um, I don't think that's the only group 
interested in connecting with the town council, right? Um, but I know that there was some dialogue about that topic and making sure that before this group disbands, which is not wildly far in the future, there's an opportunity for town council to interact with the materials and the work of the feasibility committee. Okay, um, so what are next steps um, after this? Dr. Morris, Mr. Nakajima. <laughs> okay, so, you know, meeting Thursday, 9.30. Um, and I think we're planning, I think the two pieces are one, kind of more finite and clear answers to some of the questions. The questions that came up in this conversation mm -hmm. really mirror a lot of the questions mm -hmm. that the feasibility committee uh, raised in their first interaction with these materials. Um, so one is, uh, where do we go from here on a practical level? What feedback do we give the, the design team? Um, how do we get more clarity on some of the numbers uh, behind that? And the second is, how do we do more community outreach? Uh, and what does that look like? Is it a small group listening sessions? Is it kind of more large groups, some combination? And connecting with the elected officials, the different bodies in the community with the goal, I believe, of having the full report done sort of mid to late February. Um, you know, the designers felt like that was a reasonable timeline. Yeah, although to be clear, because since this became, it was a topic I think a month ago or so, um, the, when we talk about doing outreach, it's around the report and the deliverable mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that when the we are putting together the report presentations and appendices, if there are questions the town, people in town have that when they're saying, um, I want to, are you, what, you know, what is this telling you? Or how do I, does a chart explain to you what it should explain? You know what I mean? In other words, making sure the feasibility study itself is able to be accessible and answer questions and doesn't require an expert standing next to it explaining all the charts for someone to be able to access it and become better educated about it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do you feel that you have what you need from this committee at this point in time to, yeah? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I do. I think what you should do, though, when you're planning <clears throat> ahead for your meetings, if there's a good time on the calendar to have, I mean, obviously after probably early to mid-January, if there's a good time a good meeting for the feasibility community to come back or to come back and present or discuss um, it'd be good to think about that yeah I think from from my perspective and I don't know if the committee disagrees uh, that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. um, you know we have talked before about sort of bringing back a more final product if you will um, and so I guess just working out with the, the superintendent and with the committee yeah, yeah. you know what the uh, yeah I see nodding heads yeah. <laughs> great okay great Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay, uh, so moving us along, the next item is the MSBA response um, to uh, the statement of interest. Um, and I'm going to, in a moment, turn it over to the superintendent um, to take the lead on this conversation. Um, but before doing that, I just wanted to take a moment uh, to say a few words that um, I didn't want to get lost during the conversation. So, um, and also this is just for community who may be watching at home. So, you know, in the past week or so, we've heard from many Amherst parents, caregivers, and concerned community members uh, who are understandably disappointed, they're sad, they're angry even about the uh, MSBA denial. And also the, the news that we just discussed, right, the, the high cost of the possible future projects at Fort River. Um, of course, there are going to be strong feelings when it comes to news that has such a large impact on our students' and educators' lives, and with so much consequence. It feels like everything is at stake, and we don't have a clear or easy path forward for addressing the many problems with our school buildings. That said, I'd like to urge us all to remember that while we've disagreed on the appropriate course of action, we cannot lead with anger or with shame. We need to move forward together as a community if we hope to provide safe, healthy learning environments for our students as soon as possible. And this isn't just wishful thinking. <clears throat> Communities that have advanced through the state funding pipeline after rejection have done so by showing the state that they are united in their request and ready to move forward. We must find a way to show that we're capable of collaborating, that we've come together as a community if we ever hope to leverage all necessary resources to fund any project in the near future. No matter which avenue we choose, we will need to present a united front that may not be in complete agreement over every detail, but definitely believes in a common goal and is willing to compromise to get it. I've met with community leaders on all sides of this issue recently and have heard concern from each and every one of them about how to make this right. I'm hoping that we can activate these sincere expressions of purpose and focus 
to figure out next steps and to overcome the challenges we face together. Our kids are counting on us to get this right and we can't afford to lose any other opportunities. I hope that as we here on the school committee as well as the superintendent and town government leaders and concerned community members begin planning where to go from here that we can put distrust and anger aside to make positive change happen. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morris uh, to share some more formal details about the decision um, and then so that we can discuss any next steps. Uh, but I also want to allow if there's any you know, comments or things that the, any committee member wants to say before that point um, to go ahead and do that. Mr. Dumling? Yeah, I, I would echo your, your sentiment and, and your call for, for cooperation. Um, I've also spoken at length with a number of community members. Uh, many of whom supported and many of whom opposed the, the, the past project. Um, and it, it's, it, it's a tricky thing being a human being that has a natural emotional subsystem with natural human reactions, um, wanting to be sincere and truthful with how one is feeling and yet then engage with others towards productive action. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's tricky but, but not impossible. And I, I feel like it's possible to, it's, I, th I think it's okay to be angry, it's okay to feel frustrated, it's even okay um, to feel frustrated or angry with a group or a person. I, th I think simply just having that feeling by itself, there's nothing right or wrong with that feeling. It's, it's then, what, what, how do we choose to express that feeling, to, with, with, with what action? And, and that, that's where I, I feel like the, the steps ahead are, in terms of our, our practical um, you know, what we do practically. And, and I, actually, I actually don't even think it requires trust. <laughs> I think sometimes, you know, I mean, what we went through a year and a half ago was, was pretty intense. And um, there are a lot of hurt feelings. There still are a lot of hurt feelings. And there may never be a total level of trust between all engaged community members. But, but what, we, what we do need is cooperation. You, I, feel, I feel like with a common goal, if, if we can define what the practical next step is, that that we can all agree on, that, that we can then work towards in cooperation. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tricky balancing act. It's, it's, it's not easy, um, but, but I, I definitely think it's, it's possible, and, and I would 100% agree with you that that's, that's necessary for, for, for whatever next step we take. Sure. Um, <clears throat> no, I, I, um, I absolutely agree with the foregoing sentiments. I also just think that... Um, the, the conversation we've had over the last few months about the current conditions at Wildwood and Fort River, um, both sort of the day-to-day -day, uh, condition of the buildings and experience, as well as also what we think the usable life of a lot of the building infrastructure. Um, but, you know, also we've just heard from so many people who are just every single day either working in or living and experiencing the buildings. And uh, people need to have a sense of direction and a sense of hope that within the sort of fiscal constraints that any community has and that our state has, that we're going to get to a point where we have good schools, and good facilities. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, and I think we need to focus on that. We need to build towards a consensus on it. Uh, I don't know how we want to approach that conversation and how we want to build momentum. I do agree that if we want to get back into MSBA, and the superintendent can tell me I'm wrong in a second when he finally gets the microphone, <laughs> um, is, um, I, I think the town showing some level of direction and consensus, not on the end product, meaning the building will look like this and it'll be on this site, but on a general goal and direction is probably going to be pretty important. I think the school committee being able to do that. I think the town council being able to do that. Uh, and I think members of the public um, who, can, who can eliminate the notion that there are different sides because ideally there would only be one side in this effort um, where, we're, we're, where there are lots of voices, some including people who maybe weren't the loudest last time but were concerned about property taxes and sort of how expensive this town is to live in. Um, those voices are still going to be at the table and they should be at the table, right? Because we want to be concerned about that. But the question for me is, 
when do we get to a point, I'm going to be very blunt, this is the right forum for me to have this conversation. Um, so we need to apply again for MSBI, we need to get in, and we need to have a consensus in this town that we need uh, new facilities, whether, honestly at this point, because we're in the middle of this feasibility study, whether that means 100% new construction or whether it means some percentage, I don't really care right now. If you're in favor of a new facilities that are optimal for our staff and our kids and our families, then if you agree with that sentiment, then you're on board, and that's great. The second one to me is we don't have, I don't, I don't know whether it's 2028 or 2034 or whatever the number is, and what you put on a slideshow back a year ago was somewhat hypothetical anyway, mm -hmm. um, but it's a really long time from now, right? So if realistically we could get in in the next year, then we could get something done probably in the next five years, right? Five or six years maybe, but five years. If it's five years, then the other normative bias I have is that people should come together and commit themselves to the idea that we're going to try to solve the conditions of Fort River and Wildwood both. I'm talking about facilities. I'm not talking about educational programming. I'm talking about facilities. And if we could get a consensus that we need to do that and that we need new facilities, that would be an awesome place for us to be in. There are an enormous number of details that would have to be worked out. There's the implication of regionalization <coughs> with Pelham. There's the implication of um, looking at space planning at the middle school. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to work out. But I think the spirit of the enterprise is uh, consensus, uh, putting aside some differences, not sweating disagreements around some of the details, and including, and by the way, I'm not saying they're not important. The entire point of disagreement is that the details are actually very important to people and in their lived experience. But my personal view of it is, after experience of the last couple of years, but certainly the last few months of talking about this, if, and, and this is where the process is important, I would have preferred to have this conversation a month from now or five weeks from now when we could have digged even more deeply into the capital plan and looked at what we need to do for the capital plan at the elementary level, <coughs> talked about what those needs are, talked about what the alternatives are, and frankly, to be honest with you, done a bit of a more of a deep dive um, community effort to see whether or not there was consensus that these buildings are in terrible shape and genuinely need to be replaced. So now I'm sort of just telegraphing what my answer is. Um, and so maybe I can't convene people anymore, right? Because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm too certain about what I believe. Um, but the bottom line is I don't think it's a hard consensus to get that we need new facilities, whatever that means to you. And I don't think it's a hard consensus to get that we, that we don't have 10 years, 12 years, or 14 years, whatever the hell it is, to solve this. And that if we can solve both populations and create a quality learning environment in five years, everyone should be on board to doing that. Now, how do we have the conversation and the process to get there? I don't know. I think, as I said, I'm sort of giving the answer to the, the, the problem before the problem's been posed. But I passionately believe this is something we need to do as a community. And I actually believe, I agree with something that was said earlier, that one of the surest ways to get us from a point of conflict and backward looking and towards a positive forward momentum is to focus on the positive. If we could all commit ourselves that we are going to solve this problem in the next five years, and we are going to do it, and we're going to do it together, and we're going to do it for the benefit of the kids of this town and the staff of this town, that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. And I believe we can. And you'll tell me we can. Or not. Dr. Morris. Sure. Um, so I usually don't write down my statements because I'm not very good at this. I'm not Barack Obama who can do the teleprompter thing and look like he's not doing a teleprompter. But, um, but, but I, 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 right, right. Well, not, even if I did, right, uh, I'd be bad you at it. Hold but, your notes up for you. Right. <laughs> but but, um, but I, I wrote things down because I, I think it, it's complicated. You know, my thoughts on it are really clear. How to express them is a little complicated. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, you someone used the word blunt before. I think, you know, I'll get there. Um, so I want to say. This is a framing piece that, you know, this is something that I talk to the town manager about all the time. You know, we met end of last week. No, that was yesterday. Never mind. We met yesterday. It's been one of those kind of things. Um, we, we speak about this frequently. Um, and, and I say that not because 
to talk, put Mr. Bachman on the table here, right? He's not invited to come tonight, but to say that this has to be a collaboration between the schools and the town, right? And I think people know that, but I want to start from that place of the importance that at school committee meetings, and we have some counterexamples tonight, but we temp typically have people who have either children in the schools or deep connections for historic reasons to the schools. And really what we need to figure out, you know, from my end is I can share the school's perspective, but the town's perspective is critically important in all this work. So that's why I start from that place um, to talk about it. So I've had multiple conversations with the MSBA over the, MSBA over the past week about the statement of interest process. And um, I just want to summarize some of the key points they shared. So the first was that the MSBA found the statements of interest to be detailed and complete. There was no critique of the technical discussion or submission, you know, because I, you know, anytime you don't, not successful in a submission or anything, you always want to get better, and, and they did not suggest any, oh, uh, you left out this building system or they had a question about it. They, they felt like it was a complete, full submission. They also wanted to share that they had high demand. They have many expensive projects in their pipelines. So they have two projects right now that are secondary school projects that are over a quarter of a billion dollars. One got voted successfully, one's up for a vote, I believe, this June. That's in their pipeline, but is up for a town vote. And so this impacts how many projects can be funded. They have a fixed budget, just like we do. And, um, and so when there are individual projects that have that level of capital outlay, that affects how many other projects they can take. Um, they also shared that every year of the statement of interest process is a brand new year. There's no consideration given to anything that has occurred in past years, such as prior submissions, other things. So whatever we did this year, even though that we got positive feedback on the submission, doesn't mean it's going to be more or less successful on the technical side next year because they, they look at it every year as a fresh year. The MSBA does look to cities and towns that are ready to engage with them on their projects. So kind of readiness is a component. Um, they shared when they continue to receive regular communication uh, from citizens expressing a diverse range of viewpoints, it appears to them that communities, and they're not talking about Amherst, this is a general statement, it doesn't appear that the healing or consensus has been reached uh, from a community. So they are looking about readiness. They are looking for everything that was shared by multiple committee members here. Um, and so I said, all right, so what do we need to do to make this a better? I'm hearing about the technical submission. I'm hearing about this. What do, what do we as a community need to do to improve our chances next year? Because um, they acknowledge our buildings are not in great shape, right? There was no disagreement from their point. So, I, you know, I made multiple suggestions, and the suggestion that they said um, other communities who have failed, had failed projects with them before have done that's been well received is could a statement be added to the 2019 statement of interest that would include a formal statement perhaps with data or votes from elected officials that can answer two broad questions. What do you absolutely want and what do you absolutely not want? So right, to the, to the point Mr. Nakajima said, and we haven't talked about this, so you know, it was, I appreciated the framing you offered because it really directly connects to uh, <coughs> what the MSPA shared. Um, they're not looking for exact information of square footage or, you know, what the, that kind of detail is not, even this net zero piece for them is not a detail that they'd be overly concerned about. But compared to um, some communities that have, whether it's be cost or grade configuration, a whole range of reasons why communities um, have failed projects to have um, some clarity on whatever that critical issue is so that they get a sense that the community is ready to move forward. And they'd be actively looking for that, and, and it, it is an acceptable um, part of a statement of interest submission. Um, you know, it wouldn't be, they're very clear, and I'd be very clear, it's not that the superintendent thinks, right? That that's, they, they value superintendents, they're great about, you know, how they work with educational leaders, but they're looking for what is the community value, and is there consensus in the community on how to go forward. So again, not super specific space configurations, but general size of school, right? And, and those type of things were what the MSBA um, told me that um, would be positively received if there was consensus on those things. Um, just to remind you of the timeline, statements of interest are due in April. Um, so I just want to frame out if we're backwards designing, how do we get there from here, which I'm going to speak to, you know, that's our timeline. So I'm going to go off MSBA, and then this is just sort of my thoughts moving forward. So as an educator, you know, my primary responsibility is to be an advocate for children, right? So above all the other and all the meetings I'm in, what I try to focus my attention is how can I advocate for children to have the best educational experience, period. In this particular instance, my overriding priority is getting Amherst students into learning environments with walls, um, ADA compliant spaces. In, in schools with parts, uh, mechanical parts that we can actively fix, that parts that are sold 
uh, on the open market, not on eBay, not on other places, that promote learning as soon as we possibly can. That's my priority number one, that's my priority number two, that's my priority number three. All the other pieces, the details, um, are, are way down on a secondary list of things I think about, and eventually I'll care more about them, but my main priority is that how do we provide high-quality learning experience, experiences for all students as soon as we can. And so um, I think I say that because our team of educators can make uh, learning work in a variety of, um, you know, some of those details. We can work those out, and we also have, I think we've shown ourselves as a district to be incredibly flexible. You can't walk through some of our schools and not see the flexibility of our teachers making good sense of how to make a bad situation better. Now, we don't want a bad situation in new school. I'm just saying that our level of flexibility is high, um, partially because of our experience, with the experience we've had. And so, you know, I guess my outcome is, to me, it would be a great failure for our students if our current kindergarten students, all of them, weren't in high quality, quality learning environments before they left elementary school, right? I'd love it to be all students right now. That's not in the cards. It's not feasible. But that would be my goal for the town is can we guarantee that all current kindergarten students in the town of Amherst and the Amherst Public Schools don't leave our elementary schools in open, classroom, open classrooms? And that's my goal. So... Uh, you know, we'll do our best to advocate and to, to the conversation about capital, which we'll come back to in January. We'll share more information there to improving the buildings as much as possible to that time. Um, but there's no way to address some of the fundamental issues of Fort River and Wildwood, no matter how much we spend on capital improvements over the next five years. Some of the fundamental challenges of those buildings will remain the same. And to me, that's just unacceptable. Also, to be clear of my role, I have no control whether the town will fund any schools without MSBA funding. Any thoughts in the spirit of the net zero bylaw, right, I could comment, but that's not mine to really answer. Uh, or any other aspects that are town-wide that are relevant to the work. So oftentimes I'll get asked, you know, do you think the town would fund X, Y, or Z? And, and that's not mine to say. Um, and that's why, I see, again, the collaboration of the town is so critically important. Um, it's for elected and appointed officials in the town to discuss and offer opinions upon. But at this, I will guarantee you, I'll be a dogged advocate for getting to a resolution as soon as possible to improve the learning environments for students. And that's going to be my sole priority uh, as it relates to this. Um, we have students and, and staff in spaces 180 days a year that need to be improved. They need to be improved as soon as possible. And that's where my mind is as it relates to this. Anything less than having closed classrooms with natural light, consistent heating, cooling systems that are sustainable. So we're modeling our values to our students, not just providing good learning environment, high quality learning environments, but we're actually talking about net zero by law and we currently have really inefficient buildings, which, you know, that mismatch for our students is not the model that I want to have. Um, so that's just, for me, that's where the priority lies. The other pieces um, we can work within lots of constraints. That's the constraint that we need to focus on. And just to put some context on it, Wildwood will be 50 years old two years from now, or year and a half in 2020. Um, Fort River will turn 50 in 2023, and having these buildings hit these anniversaries, when we think of the lifespan of a building being 50 years, without having really major renovations or upgrades to the core issues of the buildings uh, in those 50 years is not something that I look forward to celebrating. I'm sure we'll do celebrations of 50-year anniversaries and all the wonderful history of those schools, but there'll, be, there'll, there'll definitely be um, moments of sadness when staff members who started in 1970 at Wild would look around the building and say, yeah, we didn't like it in 1971, because I've talked to those teachers, I know those people. Um, I've heard the stories of the staff room in 1971 and how people were responding and couldn't believe that we were doing the same thing over again at Fort River. And um, to have nothing happen or nothing even really in the queue in, at those years just feels unconscionable to me. And I'm sorry to be this blunt, but this is just, you know, I want to be honest about how I'm feeling. Um, I want to actually just show something visually um, that was discussed earlier. So this is on the MSBA website. This is public access. If you go to the MSBA dot whatever there at massschoolbuildings.org, it's a one click. Um, and it brings you to this. And what this is a chart of is the cost escalation over time. So you can see that there's little um, orange dots. Those are completed projects. And then as you go into the future, 2019, 2020, uh, the different shapes indicate where the processes are, right? So the ones that are open are not fully completed yet. And what you can't see up there, but you can see on the screen because it gets cut off, is the per square foot cost. And you could see to the points that were raised earlier, a significant jump 
um, and per square foot cost steel, um, you know, all the things that other people shed. I'm not going to necessarily repeat ourselves. But for the current feasibility project, we talked about 8%, you know, from now to 2020. And uh, short of economic calamity, which we're not rooting for, um, <laughs> right, that, that there's not just educational reasons to take bold action steps now, there's actually financial reasons to take bold action steps right now. Uh, and they're seeing across the state. So when we talk about per square foot cost, uh, in the prior project, and it was coming in the kind of low to mid 400s per square foot, you can see that m that line is trending upward and trending upward pretty significantly. Um, and this is, this is every project in the MSBAQ that has a cost estimate right now. Um, so we could certainly pick projects and, and go into detail on all of them, I suppose, and if it would be useful. But that's not my point of putting this chart up. My point of putting the chart up is the time urgency is significant financially, not just on all the pieces that a superintendent I care about. Uh, all the trending is moving upwards from multiple architects, not just the ones that are working on this project, but other ones in the area that that escalation cost, we're not seeing a, that go down. And if you think of two years it being 8%, 8% of, I'm not going to put a number on it, but let's just say 50 million, I'm not going to put a finite like this project will cost, but $50 million, that's a lot of money, right? That's multiple millions of dollars. And that's going to grow and grow. So I do feel urgency both ways that my concern educationally is if we don't take action soon, things will get more and more financially um, uneasy uh, about moving forward. I think I want to close by, um, before I prompt to ask a question, I, I want to say I'm fully aware of three facts. One, there remains division among some in our community dating back to the previous project. And, you know, for me, I think that's understandable. I agree with the commentary of the committee members. And, and I'm solely focused on moving ahead. I don't spend much time, you know, if any, thinking about the prior project. I'm not saying others shouldn't, but it doesn't behoove me to, to do that um, because whether, however I felt about the prior project, it didn't pass. It's not a reality. And um, I'm most interested in the students we have and what we can do about them. The second is that my full belief is that everyone who's engaging in this issue, whatever their belief structure was in the prior project, wants the best thing for students. They want students to be in high quality learning environments. I've yet to find a person who thinks, nah, things are really fine how they are. Maybe those people are out there, I'm sure there are, but no one speaks to me about it. The people who are advocating on a whole variety of fronts on this, everyone has the same goal in mind. And the third one, and this is maybe the hardest comment to make, but um, I think I need to make it, which is good intentions won't be enough. Right, so we need collaboration, we need cooperation, we need, um, frankly, and it was word used earlier, compromise to figure out how this is gonna go forward. Um, so I think everyone's coming from a place of good intentions, I truly believe that. And if we stay just in the good intentions place and not how do we move, the next, take the next steps, I, I foresee you know, the goal that I set, which is kindergarten, current kindergarten students being in new classrooms by the time they, before they leave our elementary system. You know, I just have high, I harbor fears that. That's not going to be a goal that the community is able to reach. Um, I'll go back to start where I go back to finish where I came from, which is I'm in regular conversation with the town manager. We're meeting next week on this. And so what I'd love guidance or thoughts about is what's the process? Let me rephrase that. What are thoughts you have about how to move ahead um, and next steps the community can take to get us to a place where we have a statement of interest that has a clear statement uh, voted by, in my opinion, voted by public officials, um, elected officials, that truly strengthens our approach for next year. And then not just gets us in the process, but actually sets the course for uh, uh, um, expedited process once we're in, right? So one is just like, a, do we get in and how do we do that? And the second is if believing it, not just <coughs> that it's just a way to get in, but actually, no, we've actually already agreed on some of these core principles. We can, we can breeze through the first couple modules here of the MSBA process, because as a community, We've had enough leaders, and, and I don't mean just elected and formal leaders, but leaders in our community who have endorsed this path forward. So I know that was a mouthful. I usually don't talk that much consecutively, or, um, but I just think, feel really strongly on the issue and feel like it is, you know, if not one of, if not the critical issue facing the elementary district at this time. I appreciate your comments, Dr. Morris, and I actually would say um, I absolutely 100% believe that that it should be your priority, <laughs> uh, the way that you've outlined everything, um, just in terms of prioritizing the, the welfare and benefits of our, for our students and for our educators, frankly. Um, so I, I do agree that that's where your mind should be. I can't speak for everyone else, but yeah. from, at least from my perspective. Um, I, I appreciate a lot of what's been put into that statement. Um, 
I'm wondering if the committee has any immediate reactions or responses to what's already been raised, um, both you know the the tone and some of the ideas, or if there's other things, Ms. McDonald. I, it might just actually a clarifying question, um, and thank you for your your statement. Um, I also totally agree with with that as a top priority um, for you. But my my question is is going back to your conversation with the MSBA about mm -hmm. um, signaling community consen consensus and if you can provide any more sort of description about what does that look like mm -hmm. practically, right? You mentioned voting, you know, officials voting, but voting on what? Voting on the MSBA application or what What could that look like? Yeah, so <coughs> I think uh, I'll, I'll answer technically, but then I, I don't think your question's a technical question, so right. I want to, but I, I do want to answer technically because I think it's relevant. So both uh, in the model uh, for MSBA applications, both the school committee and in this case the town council will have to vote for it to move forward. So on a technical side, whatever agreement is written in the statement of interest has to be voted, otherwise it doesn't go to the MSPA. Mm -hmm. But at a, the larger, I think, with the, uh, to, to get closer to what I believe you were asking, um, some communities, I mean, like there's examples of communities where the cost was a big issue, right? So project failed and it wasn't, it, the, the primary issue was some people in town felt like, and I'm going to again make up numbers just because I think it makes it more tangible. You know, the project cost 30 million, and some people said, well, it should really cost 25, right? And in some of those communities, there's been agreements of elected officials and community members, like, well, actually, we're going to do this project, but we're going to cap the cost at a number that's somewhere in between. Like, I can, I know one example, or I've been told of one example where that that occurred. And so, in the next statement of interest, they were clear, like, yes, we were didn't agree on this critical issue. On the last project, we know that MSBA funded, we being them, we know MSBA funded this project and sort of lost some money, right, because the project didn't move forward and they want to see projects move forward, but we're now in a different place. And this one kind of thorny issue has been resolved and there's consensus moving forward. Um, you know, projects fail for a variety of different reasons, but I think that that's one of like the tangible <coughs> things where um, the community was able to say, we can compromise in this case on a cost that the community feels it can afford. And in this particular instance, there was the school community was, you know, there was a gap between the school community and then the non-school community in this, in this town. Mm -hmm. And they were able to work out those differences ahead of time. And MSBA was assured, you know, based on votes that were taken, oh, actually, no, this, this is fully endorsed by critical stakeholders uh, in the town. So. Um, I'm not suggesting the cost was the main driver in our particular situation, but I think uh, for us to collectively come up with something that had broad community support and is reflected in votes of kind of major elected bodies of elected officials would be the outcome that I think would be the strongest. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Dunley. So thank you so much for sharing all this. Um, with us, and I really appreciate the detail on kind of the feedback because I, I think the thing you're stressing and the thing that I'm feeling is um, the urgency. And so there are two pieces of urgency that I'm seeing here. In one, one is we want our kids in new schools as soon as possible. But now I'm also hearing the urgency of by April we need to have some sort of way of demonstrating to the MSBA that our town has gone through some sort of dialogue, I, you know, some sort of process that we can demonstrate um, and just, you know, taking, thinking this is coming right now off of your comments, but some sort of agreement on why the past project failed, which I'm not sure, if, you know, I, I think that's going to be difficult to achieve this. Um, and then also agreement on maybe potentially setting some bounds on future projects that would address the, you know, the reasons why the, the past project failed. And I, you know, think that that was going to require engaging with, um, we've mentioned the elected officials, um, membership, um, you know, there, 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 are several, there are at least two organizations or coalitions, I don't know what the right word is, but, but two community or, you know, so, so members of our community, or, sorry, tired, two <laughs> community groups that kind of represented the two opposing sides of, on this issue. I think we'd want to engage with those folks. And they're going to be the voters, too. Those, like you said, those with kids who have an investment in, in our schools that's more tangible than those without kids. And then potentially we might on maybe go up and talk to some of our state-level representatives. But to me, this is sounding like a massive project 
to get done um, in time for April, and I think it's going to require a lot of our attention, and I think what we need to, I mean, obviously we're not going to come up with a process for it all today, but I think given how urgent it is to get this funding, I think this is, to me, seems like the most viable way to move forward with our, our town and getting people on board is to have lower the cost by getting some money from the state. And this is the only way that we have that opportunity to do so. So if April's when we need to be able to demonstrate um, some sort of agreement in the community, we're really going to have to work hard. Um, so I just want to start a conversation on how we can do that um, and if it's going to potentially require convening all of these folks on some level. Because to me, I don't see how we can get here without at least having um, some engagement with, with with the groups I just listed and the, and the people I just talked about. Yeah. So one thing that I forgot to say, because I have too many handwritten notes in my <laughs> statement, because just hearing you talk made me think of a number of things, mm -hmm. which was good, but then you forget to say them, um, is I feel like, this is my perspective, it's no one else's, but my experience has been that some of the work that's happened since the failure of the prior project, so the enrollment working group, the Fort River Feasibility Study, I'm not saying it solved all wounds or, you know, everyone is, is in the same place, but I think there has been deliberate attempts to continue and to engage stakeholder groups that may have been in, on different sides of, prior, of the prior building project. Are we there yet with everyone feeling connected? You know, I don't think so. I, I also think there's relatively finite options, right? There's not 15, I mean, there may, I'm, and to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we get to the place in an, a statement of interest where we say, yeah, we want to do an addition renovation. Like, that's a level of detail that I would not suggest is appropriate, I think actually it would be read negatively by the MSBA, like how did you come to that level? That's not the, that's a level of detail that's too, too small uh, for, in my opinion. But I do think there's some, there's a finite number of solutions and I also think the town has a large role to play in this dialogue, right? So, you know, I tried to be explicit about it before by using example, but it's not mine to say whether the town can afford to do a project non-MSBA, you know, that's not, it's not I, I'm not gonna comment on that, it's not, my, it's not mine to say. But we do need the town to say, yeah, we think we can do that, or no, this is what we think we can afford, or this is in the bounds of what we think is fiscally responsible. And so I do think, in addition to what you're suggesting in terms of folks who may, be on, may have been on different sides of prior projects, engaging and having some, getting the financial recommendations from folks on the town side is crucially important. People may also not agree with me that a goal is to have all students currently in kindergarten out of open classrooms by the time they're in sixth grade. I mean, I want to be really clear that that's my, I'm going to advocate for that because I think that's the right thing for students. I don't want to presume that that's shared by the larger community, right? And I may be way off on reading the community on that and I'm not trying to be flip about it, I'm being very intentional in, in how I say it. From superintendent, that's the fastest timeline I can imagine, all students being in high quality learning environments. Um, I think we're getting, going, to, if we don't hit that, we're going to get to places, and Mr. McPherson said this all the way back in the summer, where we're having to make separate from costs of, you know, capital improvements. We're just going to get to the place where so many of the systems are outdated, the furniture, all those things that um, we're not going to have great places to go um, and how to fix some of the problems that are just hard to fix in buildings that are that old that were built in the style they were. Um, you know, riching, ripping out all the unit vents and completely changing the whole HVAC system, right? That's not it's not just the fiscal cost of it, it's is that actually practical. Um, and so, you know, for me, that's my vantage point, but that's certainly, uh, this is the first time I've said that in a public meeting, and probably in a private meeting either, um, but I want to establish a goal to see if other people agree with that, and if they do, that'll push us in a rather finite number of directions um, that I think absolutely engagement, absolutely lots of heavy lifting, but uh, as opposed to the work of the feasibility committee or other committees, um, it's not looking for that that fine green level of details. Looking at kind of the the, the big big pieces that are out there. Mr. Demling. Um So thank you for this. I like it. I like a plan of action. That's something other than let's wait a year, copy and paste the statement of interest <laughs> across our fingers. I think the community is on board with with the attempt. Um, and. I'm, I'm not going to brain dump all of my comments. I'm hoping we're going to have a pretty long conversation here because this is a pretty important point that we have really not gotten to for a year and a half. So I'm, I'm very happy that we're at this point. Um, so um, I do think you make an excellent point that we have to partner with the town. And, and my feeling is the town council and the town manager need to be very clear with us 
whether or not they'll fund two buildings or one building. I think that's clearly in their wheelhouse. That's their responsibility. Uh, I asked the town manager directly this at the four boards meeting. I think he very correctly gave me his opinion that it doesn't seem like funding, self-funding a building without MSBA is practical, but he's not an elected official, and so he can't really say definitively. We have an elected town council now. I think that's, this would be an appropriate time uh, to weigh in. Um, uh, to Ms. Spitzer's point, yeah, this is a very aggressive thing that you're proposing. Um, uh, just doing some quick math, uh, we have 100 plus days or so until the first week of April, and if we wait until our next Amherst School Committee meeting, we lose a third of that time. So what we don't plan now, unless we're going to have another meeting, which, which given the urgency and the need and the priority that everyone's expressing may very well be something we need to do even though it's holidays and incredibly hard to do schedules, um, might be something we need to do. Um, and this is with everything else that's going on. I won't line item all the other busy things that are going on, but you all know. <laughs> um, so it's very challenging. And I also think not guaranteed to succeed. I think, like everyone else has said, there is still a, quite a strong level of disagreement on a number of very key um, design issues of what a new building or buildings would be. Um, Mr. Nakajima expressed, a, a, I think, a very well-reasoned opinion about why uh, if we get in, we need to have that project take care of both Fort River and Wildwood. I would tend to agree with him. Um, I know that there are people in the community who don't share that feeling under any design. I know that there are some deal breakers, like, for example, under any building size, under any grade configuration. And, and I'm purposely pulling out the most yeah. emotionally charged phrases because <laughs> if, we're, if we're really going to you know, proceed in a pragmatic, eff efficient manner here, you know, we have to just directly confront these things, you know. I think um, any statement of general community consensus is going to have to face head on the issue of grade configuration and, and what, what grades are we looking at in a building. I think it's going to have to talk about size, what the minimum or maximum size is going to be. And made all the more difficult by the fact that a number of things that may affect that size, like the uh, Amherst Palm regionalization, like the um, fe uh, feasibility study of sixth grade, to the middle school and, and some other things, um, we're not going to know by the first week of April. So we're going to have to take our best guess. Um, I, th I think it's also complicated by the fact that um, key stakeholders and community members aren't very easily defined <laughs> um, beyond elected officials. I, I would say it's certainly at a bare minimum, it's going to be the current school committee and town council um, and, and, and town manager. I would, I would imagine the town manager. Um, if, uh, and, and even that's imperfect, right, because a school committee that's eventually going to vote on, on an MSBA project is going to be years from now. <laughs> and so very well may be composed differently. But we're the best proxy, right, for, right. for what the school committee is. Same thing with the town council. Um, and so, yes, like, I mean, I'm looking out into the room now, and I, I can see, you know, prominent figures who have advocated strongly on both sides of the past project. Um, but like you said, that, that's not the only stakeholders. And so defining that in a way that the community feels involved um, I think is going to be critically important because, again, to be to be blunt and very direct, <laughs> in the interest of time, you know, the school committee and the town council both have a majority of members who are publicly in support of the past project. I, I think probably a super majority, <coughs> if I'm counting, <laughs> depending on how you count the numbers. Um, so there's a public perception, you know, there, and so I think I think that that has to be done. That said, it can't all, it can't be done so much that it feels like a, di a diluted sense of false equivalency co compromise. You know, you, you talked about, Mr. Nag Nagadima was very clear about the very good reasons that I agree with about, about, the, about the, the, uh, the reasoning of, of why accepting one building. Um, but I think those, you just sort of bullet item what those big ticket broad stroke pictures are, right? Not down to the size of the book closet, but, you know, great configuration, one or two buildings, um, how, how long are we willing to wait, uh, size of building, um, possibly, the net zero spirit um, may be something we need to uh, talk about in a consensus. I don't know. That's, so this would be a discussion, right, about like if, if, if the end point deliverable here is a letter that is signed by a number of community members and or elected officials, what, what do we want to include on that? Sort of the first thing we need to do. Um, so, <laughs> so I think it's pretty challenging um, and, and not guarantees to, su to succeed. But, you know, what do we have to lose other than our time and energy? <laughs> and I'm willing to put in our, my own time and energy, given the urgency. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess I'll stop there so, so that's not a full brain dump of all my thoughts. At some point. Mr. Nakajima. Oh, really? Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I really I appreciate your, your thoughts. Um, I'm relieved that they align with a lot of mine. Um, I, I think I don't I don't think we have any choice, and I also think that um, we need. I, th I I'm just going to tell you what I think. Um, I I think that we also need to put a straw man on the table on on a set of principles, not because we have to live and die by them, but I think we, we're never going to get from here to there in April or even if we got a vote right. from uh, town, you know, the town council in May or June that we then said mid late or something. We're never going to get that done. If we literally start with a complete tubular acid and we say everything's on the table, let's start with a blank slate. Um, I also think that the condition, I mean, again, I'm making my argument, but I actually think the, con the, the cost of the capital, five-year capital program for the elementary schools in the current conditions of Fort River and Wildwood um, mitigate against the argument. It's a it's a powerful counter argument, both fiscally as well as practically, for why it'd be a good idea to try to um, submit uh, to solve both. I agree with what Mr. Demling just said that that's a kind of that even though I'm staking a position, that's also a question, right? Like if we took that to the public and it turns out a huge number of stakeholders disagreed and said, no, you need to you need to have one what are so-called neighborhood, I guess they'd call it modestly sized elementary school, um, and that's really the feedback we got, then obviously I'd listen to that and say, okay, well, if the first principle is we need new facilities, then, then my first principle would be let's make sure we don't screw up getting at least one new facility, right, at least one new elementary school. Um, and I'd want to make sure we do everything we possibly can to make sure we get that. Having said that, I, I'm not... I am not convinced it's too high a lift, given the current conditions of the schools, and given actually that, if anything, with any, there's no guarantee to what happens to the middle school or happens to Pelham, but the good news is in either scenario, utilizing the middle school or Pelham would only mean you could build a more modestly sized elementary school and still solve for both the problems of Fort River and Wildwood. So in other words, you could start with a maximum number to solve both Wildwood and Fort River, and know that a lot of the intervening factors in the, in the, in between we don't know of between now and the time we're going through a building program are likely to make it even more modestly sized. I think it would also be worth looking at, I know it was already done, but more again. Um, what, what does it really look like to design uh, a, a, a single solve building that has the look and feel that gives a friendly and more intimate feel to families and to students. So if there's a way of, of basically solving for the idea that it's going to be some big impersonal behemoth and won't feel that way, if there's a way to mitigate that feeling, I think it's worth trying to mitigate that sentiment. Um, i got to be honest with you, I'm really ruthless on this. My actual view is uh, I think there are a lot of important issues that we could be bringing up in the context of this building. So there are some people who would want to go to as, uh, as environmentally advanced a building envelope as possible relative to PV. And there are other people would say if we could save $5 million doing PV instead of a more tighter building envelope, then let's save the money. That is actually something I kicked a can down the road to the actual building project design and say, no, we're not going to solve that right now. Um, we, we obviously, anything we do has to be has to conform with the zero energy bylaw, and it'll conform with the zero energy bylaw. No question about it. Other things like um, great con configuration, any future school committee has the power and the ability to do great reconfiguration regardless of what facility gets built. So what I would actually beg people to do in the spirit of getting consensus is say, let us defer a decision around any future programming around grade alignment or anything like that to future school committees who can argue it out, decide it, build consensus, and try to get something like that done. If, if, the, if the belief is the facilities are broken and that they're too expensive to fix and they need to be replaced as soon as possible, I would argue the consensus we should be trying to get that we hold everyone's feet to the fire on is to get that we all come together around getting new facilities as soon as practically possible, meaning a new MSB th a thing, 
and that we're focusing on solving Fort River. I mean, so I'm, this is my argument. Other members of the committee can disagree. Members of the public can disagree. But I'm, what I'm, the, the argument I'm making is essentially both a practical and a political one. Not only can future school committees be a reasonable venue, actually even this school committee, frankly, like next May, could be a venue for those same arguments. And I don't have any problem with that because it's all about discussing what's in the best interest of kids and the best educational program. And we can do that without, while also still maintaining a positive and affirmative consensus around the need to replace the facilities. And to me also, that's an easier thing. So my point would be, I guess, this, but I don't want to belabor it. My point would be, I would want to know from both stakeholders who are literally sitting in our audience actually right now, um, as well as others who are watching, as well as members of the town council and other stakeholders, what's the minimum consensus that we can come together on that is meaningful, so it's actually saying something that matters. That's why I stick my oar in the water of saying we're gonna fix both Fort River and Wildwood at the same time. Because I think that's a meaningful, it's, it says something that means something, right? It's not like, oh, we want a new building. No, it's a kind of, it's a, there's a range, but it is a specific solve we're trying to get that we're trying to do that in the next um, MSBA acceptance. Uh, and then I agree, we need to find a process to try to mediate out a lot of the other details, because the details are gonna matter enormously to people, and I'm not remotely diminishing that. But if we can hang together that we are committed to replacing these schools and improving them, then I, I actually, am, uh, weirdly enough, I'm actually optimistic we could get accepted and move forward. And I don't know why, but I am. So I'm gonna jump in also. I mean, I think uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, I actually also share the optimism and uh, am heartened to hear some of the feedback that came back from the MSBA because I actually think given the amount of attention that the previous project has gotten in our community during the past two years that enough people already have heard uh, arguments on all different sides and have you know kind of made up their minds about where that what they've, they've, they valued and what they believed but most people that I've talked to, no matter what the details were, have said, we need to figure out a solution right away. And I hear the concerns from some committee members about the timeline for putting together a statement or you know, some sort of signal to the MSBA that says that we're ready. Um, but I actually think it's doable. And I think it's doable because we have, again, this community that has been rallying around these problems in these schools for such a long time and have been expressing so much concern and the desire to, to fix things and to make them better that I think word can spread like wildfire with something like this, right? And I think that people are, are primed already to, to want to do something about this. I agree that we have to take care of both buildings. Um, I, you know, we've heard for the past couple of years again, you know, the, we keep shifting the priority from Wildwood to Fort River and then probably back to Wildwood at some point. These buildings cannot, they're basically in the same exact shape, they cannot continue to stand as they are. And so I agree that we have to do something for both of those buildings and we have to figure out a solution that addresses both of those problems simultaneously. Um, I think given the, the restrictions that we've heard from the town just in terms of, of what is, is practically feasible, given our taxpayer base, given a whole host of different things that we cannot move forward without MSBA funding. And for that reason, then, it does feel like um, we have to take action on this, you know, by April to try to do something with that. And I say that because the alternative is that we end up waiting until next year, right? We end up waiting until April of 2020. And I can't imagine any community member that I could go to right now and say, well, actually, you know what? We're not doing anything this year. We're just gonna go and wait until next year, right? To, to, you know, because we're gonna try to get some, some level of consensus on all sorts of details or whatever. I don't think that that can happen. Um, and I don't think practically we should expect our, our students and our community to wait that long. I think a lot of people have been trying to look back on us to say, take some action, do something, and do it now. So, I've heard that loud and clear, um, and that makes me want to move quickly on something like this. Now, I also agree that I don't think 
delving into certain types of details are beneficial at all with, with this uh, exercise. I think that it's really more about, you know, you, you mentioned two broad questions, right? What do you want and what do you not want? I think if we can <coughs> articulate at least an outline of what we want, that, that gets us pretty far. And that if we can bring that to our town leaders and say, this is what we're aiming for, you know, do we have at least your general buy-in? We can figure out all the details later on, right? There's going to be so a million and one different questions, you know, and even, even the budget question, the cost question, is something that we will be figuring out when a project actually comes to fruition. For all the reasons that we just stated before, right, those things are getting expensive. And, you know, there's decisions that a future school committee or a future building committee can make or a future town council will make based on what the resources are available at that time and that we have no control over right now. So for us to set a cap even, right. I think is unrealistic. Um, but I think that if we can at least get to, to answer those two general questions, and maybe what this might look like is an initial conversation that we have with town leaders to sort of get a sense of where people are, what they're, you know, they're, they're willing to, <coughs> to engage around. And if then we can circulate some of those initial ideas throughout the community, and so this includes all you know folks from all different sides, right, who've kind of fallen on different things, and, and have them give us some feedback. Does this feel feasible? Is this something I want to give them something to react to, though? I don't want to put out an open survey or an open idea because I think people just generally come up with too many ideas, and they haven't been a part of these conversations even to, uh, to di tonight. So I would want to give them something to react to and say, does this feel like something that you can actually engage around and that you might be able to provide, you know, uh, to support were it to be put forth as part of our application process and see where we land. And I think, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about some forums um, later tonight. This could be a part of that conversation, right, in forums. Uh, again, not an opportunity for, not, not a, you know, a request for people to rehash things that went wrong or anything like that, but really to help us answer those two broad questions. What do you want and what do you not want? And if we can get some consensus around that um, and build in those forums within a timeline that helps us put together this application, and then I think we'd be looking to you, Dr. Right. Morris, to, you know, your, you and your staff to actually start putting together the application, right, within right. the next couple of months. So at least that part is taken care of, right? None of that has really changed that much. Um, and then all we're working on is really just building out this, this statement of support for the application. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. I don't know if committee, I saw someone raise their hand before me, so I want to. Yeah, I, I guess just a, an sure. immediate reaction to what you've heard and then maybe Ms. McDonald. Sure, yeah. yeah, it absolutely makes sense. Um, you know, I, again, because of the feedback we received, there's not a tremendous amount of, the, the technical application is, is, you know, unfortunately doesn't change that much year to year, right? I mean, the same problems. I mean, Wilds would have to be updated a bit with the kind of functioning boiler, but, you know, that that's where we will be when we submit this in April. Hopefully, submit this in April. I think the statement is actually the the work that has to go into it is really about the consensus building and then adding the statement around that um, is much more significant workload than the actual rest of the application. So I agree. Ms. I I just wanted to echo sort of I think the comments that that both you both of you have um, described and. And I share the optimism in our ability to get that done, even though it is a very tight time frame. I do think um, that focusing on, you know, in my world, we call it the MVP, minimum viable product, right? So, get, you know, outlining that, mm -hmm. describing what are the big pillars that we want to see in, in any building project, and not that this should be in there, but I also endorse that both buildings have to be replaced or addressed simultaneously. Um, I think not just from a facilities perspective, but also just from a town and population perspective, that would be a disaster to have one being addressed and the other one sort of, well, we'll get there when we get there. Um, I, I don't think that that's a, a route that we want to be going down. Um, but I do think that it is possible for us to come to some collection of pillars and, and principles of what we want to see in any building project going forward. Um, and I also agree with sort of that that we should put something out first for people to react to and edit, if you will, through through the forums and sort of iterate on that over the course of the next several months. I think that can be a great process to get us to something that 
we can demonstrate community consensus. I'm less interested. I, I know they said what you want and what you don't want. Um, I think really focusing on, on the what we want, um, and, and not to say that we shouldn't pay attention to what we don't want, but I fear at this stage that that could sort of bring up sort of old skeletons, right? Mm -hmm. That we don't really need to, I, I agree with you, I'm, I'm looking forward, I don't want to look back, but um, talking about what we don't want, that could very easily be, well, I don't want what we had, right? <laughs> and we don't, we don't want to have that conversation. It's really, what do we all agree that we want to see and need to see in our building project going forward? Yeah, to me, that's one of the reasons why um, not only whatever straw man or draft we would develop, but I think even the end product, um, one, I completely agree with what Ms. Donald just said, that we should be focusing on the affirmative. Mm -hmm. um, my personal view is that even if, my personal view is even if a lot of things that were in the old project weren't in a new project, if the new project was a state-of-the-art building that saw both Fort River and Wildwood and incorporated a lot of the design elements that were articulated by the superintendent earlier, and we did it in a way that, uh, uh, you know, that we felt good about going forward. Um, my God, it would be an amazing home run. And if we did it in five years, it would be a, such a remarkable accomplishment. It would feel positive. In other words, people would be more thinking about what we were able to get done and less about, um, there are always going to be, I mean, the reality is there are always going to be challenges, right? As, as a school committee 10 years from now is going to be confronted with the town, our schools, our teachers our superintendents, maybe you, uh, will be confronted with all sorts of challenges in 10 years that we can't predict what they are. It's the nature of the work. Um, solving this facilities problem, this learning environment problem, is such a hugely important thing to do that it's worth everyone focusing and sort of norming themselves around what would a shared commitment look like that could be articulated in simple pillars. But the reason why I'm glad that at least a few of you referenced the, solve, maybe everyone, solve both different levels of commitment, solving both buildings, that it can't be jello. The point is, whatever the pillars are, they have to be, they have to be meaningful. So for example, if people don't agree with doing both buildings, whatever that looks like, you want to hear it, because the bottom line is, if that's something we're saying we agree on doing, that's an important thing to say we agree on doing. And it would mean that two years from now, after we're in the process and we're working on it, there are no surprises to anyone because we all agreed we were going to do that and we're going to move forward. Um, so anyway, my point simply on it is I agree with the affirmative. I agree we have to hear what people don't want, but I think that's not, that's not what the other point would be is I think when you're thinking about an end draft, not just an initial one, but an end draft people are voting on, it's not two pages long. It's not hundreds of words. To be honest with you, I would start with like four sentences and see how many more than four, and that are meaningful. How many more than four sentences do we need to have a meaningful statement of shared commitment that would actually really cohere the town? That's my thought. Mr. Dumbling. Great. So yeah, I completely agree with that. As the simpler the better and the more and if, if we can have it be simple and short it's going to be more in the spirit of what we're talking about these broad brush you know I, when I think about like the conversations that are going to happen the next 108 days or whatever <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it, it's about a small number of variables that we're going very deep on small number of high level variables that we're going very deep on that are in interconnected right so we're not talking about square footage of book closets we're talking about size of building. We're talking about one building or two buildings. And um, I mean, as to grade configuration, it's like, I mean, we'll hear, I guess we'll hear this, you know, and what people get back to us in terms of, uh, you know, what do you want or absolutely not want. You know, my, my sense is that conflating a conversation about the relative values or not about different grade configuration setups with a building project just makes it more complicated. In, in other words, I can't, Whatever we feel about the value of a different grade configuration, I can't see a scenario in which it increases the likelihood of a building project succeeding to conflate it. <laughs> um, so, uh, like Mr. Nakajima mentioned, um, you know, a, a way to, to you know defer that. I, I don't know if we can completely defer it in terms of well, let's just not talk about it because I, I honestly do think that there's just 
too high a level of anxiety and, and, and fear, frankly, in the community about that that because that's that's a specter, that's a skeleton that some people are afraid is going to come back, and that was a, a concern for a number of people. Um, but because it is like uh, as has been noted, it's a school committee policy could come back at any time, at any meeting from now until the dawn of time, because it's school committee policy. Some kind of language where we are committing to at least, you know, deferring it and uh, committing to decoupling it from a building project. I mean, it, it, there's, there's a wording thing here, but something where we're being honest and acknowledging that a building project does not set grade configuration until the end of time. We can't do that, um, but it's it's not going to be, you know, part of that. I, th I think that would that would simplify it. But again, that's that's part of the work of un undoing those those um, those knots. Um, and you know, I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll put my own in the water too. You know, I, 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 well, I think probably already said this, but I also agree with the sensibility of, of getting both done at once, um, not just for the educational purpose, but for the fiscal purpose. Because I think, you know, what, one big picture thing that, that I worry about at the end of the day is I think the biggest hurdle is the very last hurdle, which is the public debt exclusion override. Asking the public to voluntarily increase their property taxes, many of whom it would be a hardship for. Um, and that's a very real concern, and I'm sure we all share that concern, and yet we need new schools. And so how do we balance the two? And so, um, you know, m making sure that, that we are as, uh, as sensitive to that as possible, um, I, I think is critical. So I'll stop there. Dr. Morris, did you want to respond? Or? I'm thinking about whether I want to respond. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll definitely say one thing. I'm not sure about the second. I'll see how I feel in two minutes. Um, so I think one of the challenges with the engagement piece is people are rightfully going to be asking lots of questions, and there's the number of variables we had two months ago is is greater than the number of variables we have now. Not that the cost estimates could go back to the previous agenda item, not that they're not drafts and not that they're not don't need work, but they give some sense of scale, um, and that's really helpful, right? It also gives some sense of scale to the multiple options around new building, renovation, what's possible. So I want to be really clear in stating that I feel like the time is, we're in a good place to engage this because we have more information than we had previous, uh, previously. And I think there's some <coughs> process benefits of the enrollment working group and the Fort River feasibility, but there's functionally, we know more things now than we knew a couple months ago, and that helps us engage. And the lingering piece is always going to be the variables. Well, when are we going to get an MSBA? If we try to do one school at a time, well, how much would that, right? There, there's not going to be finite, defined. We know the answer to those questions. And I think around the margins of them, we have to, and by we, I'm saying the collective we, people who care about the schools in the town, um, we have to be willing to take, you know, our best guess and take a little bit of a leap one way or the other, right? And I think that's really hard when we're talking about this level of project. But uh, for someone to ask me, well, if we get in, if we do one at a time, exactly when we get in the second time. I don't even know when we get in the first time, right? So I think what I know is that it would be significantly removed because you'd be working on one project at a time, you know, as per their policy. Um, but I think those are the, some of the harder kind of nuanced conversations as people come up with questions and legitimate concerns of how do we respond not being able to say we can definitively say this is exactly the timeline to, to Mr. Nakajima's point what I presented last year was a best guess estimate I was clear there was multiple ranges of estimates on that um, and that's not different now um, so I, I, I just want to caution not the committee but just put out my caution that um, we have to figure out a way to talk about these issues um, that's both clear what we know and clear what we don't know but have a pretty good sense of. Because I think in life we're always trying to look at, like, we can look and find the answer to exactly when this would happen in the future. And I'm probably overplaying my point, but I, I'm pl overplaying it based on experience. Um, that, you know, I can't tell anyone with firm clarity exactly when we'll get in, no matter what the town agreement is, um, but the things we do know, which we can say is, well, if we're addressing both for all the reasons you suggested, right, there's some knowns there, but, you know, I just want to, uh, caution is too strong a word, I just think about um, the challenge in the process is there's no guarantees. Yeah. That's probably what I should have just said all, all along and not done the last 90 seconds. So, uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's great. I mean, this is 
part of the, the point of this this conversation, right? right? Um, I, I have heard a couple things come through from the committee yeah. as, as far as next steps are concerned, so I do want to get to that Please. very yeah. soon to, to help move us, but Mr. Nakajima, was there a point that you wanted to... You no, know, I was just going to say that, I mean, the reality is this isn't an act of engineering, and this isn't a, this isn't a <laughs> price, precise process. I mean, right. the, the buildings are, right? right? I'm not trying to be facetious. Um, this is about setting a direction, yeah. and it's about setting a set of values. That's also the reason why the simplicity is important, because the shared set of goals or values that we get everyone to commit to is always going to be a subset of the total set of values people have, right? <laughs> and that's okay, right? Because that's this is about the community coming together, solving a problem, and feeling really good about it. I know I'm going to sound really Pollyanna, but the entire point is, if we're moving forward and we're flipping the switch on this thing, and we're going to try to accomplish this over the next few months, this isn't about anything negative. This is about something really positive. This is about in five years' time, or six years' time, right. we've, we've solved a tremendous challenge we have in our educational learning environment, and we're all doing it together. And so my point, my point on this is that a lot of, no one's saying we have to do this because we know for a fact right. that the, year, the out year for a second building is 2023 or 4 or 2029 right. or whatever the hell it is, pardon my language. We don't, we don't know that, and that's, that's not the reason why you're going to say it's important and you're committing to doing it, right. right? I mean, we have a sense that two buildings built separately over a period of 10 or 15 years <coughs> is likely to be even more expensive than one building built in the near future to solve both, but we don't know with precision what that number is. Mm -hmm. And I would argue if somebody's willingness to support this shared endeavor is dependent upon having that analysis and that number, then we're dead in the water, right? That's not going to work. Because the bottom line is, it's important to do. And it's important to do, it is likely to actually be fiscally more prudent to do it now than later. And if it's genuinely a shared commitment and a shared process to, from now to down the road with a future building committee, then there are a million details to be worked out that taxpayers in the town can argue about to make a building more efficient that people are going to argue about around the size of the play area and how the buses pull in and drop off kids. And God bless them. I'm looking forward to people arguing their socks off around those things under the shared commitment that we're going to come to a project we agree on and we're going to do it. So just very quickly, uh, I just... Go ahead, because I, 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 I do want to wrap up this yeah, I promise you, <laughs> it's not in response to what Mr. Nakajima okay, said. And actually, ahead, I think it pushes ahead. us to the next steps. Yeah. So hopefully it's a, it's a little bit of a dour segue, but it's a segue. So, um, you know, the other thing that MSP has shared, you know, because I shared, you know, okay, that's really helpful feedback. You know, we're in a good, better place. I shared about the feasibility study, and we're gathering more information. And there's, you know, folks in the community who may have been on opposite sides of a prior project who are now functionally, we have two examples of working collaboratively together, and that's really important. And, you know, the comment I received back about, you know, I asked, what if, what if we can't do this by April? You know, what if it's not possible? And the response is, you know, I'm not making, you know, she, the person I was speaking to was not in a decision-making role on the statement of interest, but said, you know, well, you have to think about whether the community is really ready to commit the statement of interest, right? Or if you really need that extra year to 2020 to get the community together. She was extremely clear with me mm -hmm. that they did not look negatively upon that. They said, you know, it was really, if your community is ready, they'll show that they're ready. If they're not ready, they're going to show they're not ready and maybe the 2020 is a more realistic application for your community. Um, I think that's worth sharing because it was mm -hmm. a very direct point about that. And to be honest, I appreciate the directness of the MSBA in general. They're, they're, I, I'd much rather have that than sort of a wishy-washy answer. They were not wishy-washy on that topic. Yeah. And that's a great point. I mean, I think, uh, you know, in a very practical point too, right? right? If a community is not ready, they're not ready. Yeah. <laughs> we can't force it. And right. I think we've learned that also that, you know, that there's, there are projects that will not uh, come to fruition if people are feeling in any way like this is not the right project or, you know, they're not ready for it or whatever. So, but just in the interest of, of wrapping yeah. up this, this uh, mm -hmm. topic and with the committee's permission, what I, I've heard a couple of things that I just want to repeat back just to make sure that everyone is, is in alignment. So one is that we, we are going to aim for April of this year, at least, to try to get some sort of engagement. I'm looking to everybody just to see, like, heads nodding or <laughs> head shaking. Um, 
that we will try to get some kind of, of community uh, consensus together, whatever that ends up looking like, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that also said that we want to address both buildings. I've heard pretty much everybody say that. Um, so it sounds to me like that's a, that's a great positive step forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm hearing is um, to put forth some sort of uh, thing for people to react to, right? So that would probably necessitate, I think, uh, some sort of group work or, you know, smaller um, conversation of, of folks to, to help bring something back to this committee, maybe at our next meeting. Um, and then that allows Dr. Morris, you some time, I think, to check back in with the town manager and with other folks here in town to see what where we think we can get to. Does that make sense to you? Um, any other thoughts or ideas that you have or if there's anything else that I've missed? So the, only the three points that I've, I've sort of picked up from tonight. Yeah, and I heard the same three things. So I wanna, um, yeah, so the only timeline thing that I'm having trouble, I'm having cognitive dissonance about is what's the role of the school committee and the town council and what's the interplay? So, you know, is the school committee going to write a statement to be discussed publicly before the town council has been able to weigh in on some of the financial ramifications? I don't have an answer. It's just a question that I want to pose. And from a process perspective, what's the right process, mm -hmm. uh, particularly as it relates to town councilors um, and making sure they feel included? Um, mm -hmm. And it, um, and that's something that I certainly can talk to, as I mentioned, I'm meeting with the town manager next week and get his two cents on. I mean, he's got a better, I've not been to a town, mount, town council meeting to date. I think it's extremely yeah. important yeah. is to actually check in with the town manager and get his input on that. Yeah. I think you have a good sense of where the school committee's timing yeah. would be and where we would want to yeah. engage. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of the comments that have been made previously about, you know, making sure that we're not waiting too long uh, for a school committee conversation simply because it, you know, yeah. will make it a lot harder for us to be able to bring back to the community any of, any of the thinking or anything like that, right? So sooner rather than later, and, you know, Mr. Nakajima. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with everything you're saying. I also think it, I don't see, I'm not saying you're saying this, but I don't see anything you're saying is contradicting the notion that our committee could still work on mm -hmm. drafting and putting our thoughts oh, yeah. together because I think one, it'll just help advance the ball. Two, I think I, the spirit of what you're saying, I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume the rest of the committee agrees um, that we're trying to find consensus, we're trying to find a process that engages everyone that clearly starts with the town council, right? So, so anything we're doing in drafting, um, if the first thing we hear back is a really strong pushback on some of the core ideas or principles that we're putting forward, or ideas, then we're going to be all ears to hear that. But I think even there, I, my view is the positions that everyone have expressed, the ideas we've all expressed here today, come from experience. They don't come from no place. They come from a lived experience, both of the buildings, but also of hearing from the community, of wrestling with these issues for a while. And so the flip side of it is if I were the town council, I would want to hear what we're saying, assuming what we're putting together is done in the spirit of a very first conversation, a desire for their input, obviously on the fiscal side of things. So I think, I mean, my point would be, it seems to me you could engage heavily in the way you're describing, and the committee could put together some draft ideas that would then inform that conversation. It's an idea. Mr. Dumling. Um So that sounds good. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, my logistical, so I also feel hopeful, you know, like there's, people have expressed hope, you know, and it, it is weird around this topic to feel hopeful. It's the first time I felt particularly possibilities are possible, creative, hopeful, and, I don't know if that's too articulate. Um, so, but, but that's we're feeling right here because we are so, like, zoned in on this conversation, right? I'm trying to think of the community that's going to get wind of our conversation and, oh, did you hear the school committee was all, like, jazzed up and hopeful about the future. I'm like, okay, that's great. And then we're not meeting until, you know, January, what is it, 11th or 18th or whatever. And so, and so this just kind of sits. And I, and I don't, I don't think that Dr. Morris will, will want for things to do on this. I'm sure he could talk to the town council, the town manager, and things will, and we could draft on our own, our ideas. I'm trying, I'm thinking about the public just sort of waiting, TikTok, and they sort of don't know anything's going on. And we're losing like a third of our time to engage the public. And, and I, don't, I don't know, I don't, 
I don't, I don't want to add meetings unnecessarily, but I, I don't know if how else that we can, um, you know, uh, bring our draft ideas together in a way that honors open meeting law <laughs> um, and, and talks about a next step forward because this is such a new idea. Dr. Harris? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I think Carrie. Well, I, I'm feeling I, I may need to. Yeah. <laughs> just, just say, but I don't want to leave. I, without having a chance to say, I agree with Mr. Demling, we do need to get moving on this. And, and all of my expressions of the urgency of this weren't to say that it's not possible. I'd like to reiterate <laughs> that I, I do believe we should and will be able to come up with something in April and we should submit in April. And I, I guess my only concern is when you were saying that we all agree on the need to address both buildings at the same time. I'm a little worried about the perception from the public on that is that it's somehow us using code for like we need to have a one building solution. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's something that we can, I'm worried that will backfire on us. And I think, I think we need to stay, at least in these very early conversations, stay open to, you know, I, I agree with, I want my kids to, you know, to know, be in uh, all of the kids of Amherst, regardless of which district they're in, to be in a quality building environment. But I'm a little worried if we lead with, without saying explicitly, you know, we're not saying it explicitly, but it, I, I'm worried it's going to be interpreted as such that we're saying we're, we're all behind having a one building solution to this. Um, and I'm just putting it out here because of this time frame, because mm -hmm. we don't have the time to, to build consensus um, without starting this conversation now. So I, I guess as we start drafting that, I think maybe it's, it, it, maybe that's what we come to. Maybe that is, is the only way to address these fiscal challenges. But I'm worried that that might be a deal breaker for many members of our community. And if that's the case, and then we may end up having this conversation again in a couple of years, or even just next next time this year. So um, I guess I'm just putting it out there because I, I want to make sure we're, we're clear about how we're communicating, and I'm not ready to say that like the only way I see it dealing with this right now is is through one building. Yeah, I may get there, but I, I'm not there yet. Um, so just because of my fear that it's going to I'd like to hear from other members of the community before I say that the school committee's beyond that. It's not that I don't agree with mm -hmm. that we might get there. Um, so on that, I may have to leave <laughs> just because <laughs> this little one has got um, needs that I need to address. Um, and I'm really sorry to step out on this because it's not that I don't think it's highly important. I really care about this. No, so thank you so much. Especially because yeah. I hope she'll be in a building that's new. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a diaper to change. So. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Spitzer. Thank you. Um, Okay, so, uh, you know, I guess, uh, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's a question for the committee just in terms of uh, the you know, meeting schedule and, and when we would want to meet. Um, you know, I am conscious of the fact that the holidays are upon us, and so, and, you know, I think the district is actually technically closed for a couple of weeks, and so there's, you know, there's some time. I know the superintendent is probably working, <laughs> a few other people are as well. Um, I know I'm working. Um, however, that said, it's you know it's definitely a time of, of year when a lot of people, not just the folks sitting at this table, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of the community members are also kind of checked out with their families and all of that. So you know, definitely changes how people engage around things like that. That said, I think um, you know it's it's a committee decision, Dr. Morris. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I have a hard time. I'm gonna. I have a thought about Ms. Spitzer's comment, but I'm going to stick to the <coughs> scheduling of meetings because I think we could talk about that at the next meeting, um, as hard as it is for me. Um, so I'm happy to meet next week. I'm in a little bit next week. We could certainly meet the week after. You know, um, I do think getting a time where there's not eight other items on the agenda where we can just talk about this. Um, I think there's some limitations probably all of us have on schedule, but if it's possible to schedule another meeting the next week or the week after, I think that we it behoove us to do it behoove us to do that, and I'm we, very open to, to making that work as long as people if we can figure out the scheduling. So I we, I we also have the week of the seventh because our next meeting's not until the twenty second. So, um, I just yeah, like, I agree we should meet before the twenty second right. <laughs> of January, right. but um, um, I don't know if it has to be next week. 
And I would also say, I mean, if, if the end goal is truly to get more community engagement, that's not yeah. going to happen next week. Right. Right. Between right. Christmas and New Year's and, you know, all yeah. the other holidays the that opposite. are taking place. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I think my preference would be if we were to try to schedule something for it to be probably, you know, the earliest would be the week of the 7th um, mm -hmm. to have some engagement. That doesn't mean we can't have the other, you know, uh, I think one-on-one -on -one conversations and any other kinds of meetings that we, we would want to have, you know, separately. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that yeah, that's... Perfectly fine with me. I mean, I, I'm somewhat limited by other committee meetings I have that week, so probably I know it couldn't be on a Tuesday, for instance. Um, but as long as people have flexibility on other nights, um, you know, my friends in Pelham want me there on Tuesday. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. So I'm, I'm sure we all feel this, but I feel like before we close, we should articulate um, because this is such, going to be such a fast moving process, and we're talking about elected officials and key stakeholders and community leaders that, that we, we will have opportunity. I mean, you have it right now. You can just email us um, to for the general public to provide their input on yeah. on this. And this is not going to be a closed door. Hey, the decision makers are going to make this. You know, then we'll get back to you. This is going to be a public, open thing. You know, we're going to we're going to try and articulate. It's not going to be completely open. We'll have the straw man and all the principles we talked about. But there will be that opportunity. It won't be closed. Right. And I think you know, as I mentioned before, I think we want something that people can react to, right? right? And engage in, not just open it up. Right. So yeah. Mr. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I, I said it earlier, um, I don't care if as soon as today or tomorrow, I mean, I can see at least five people in the audience right now who probably would have great opinions to offer on what they think would be important to see or not to see as principles in a framework thing like this, including uh, Ms. Spitzer's comment earlier about the relative size or number of buildings, um, and I think it would be great to hear it. Because, I mean, in other words, getting that feedback, emails or whatever, yeah. as soon as possible mm -hmm. from anybody who's watching, anyone who's involved, to understand what their thoughts are uh, on what we're saying would be great. And, and, and even, I, I don't want to belabor because I know it's, it's hours late um, for this item, but um, I still, I actually think it's, I, I mean, whatever the end result is, I think the idea that the committee puts its oar in the water around what its statement of sort of values or principles are is not at all a bad thing to do since we don't exist in an environment in which this is, again, like, I've never given this any thought. I wonder what, how I'd start thinking about this tomorrow if I chose to. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. And I'm saying that's regardless of the previous project. I mean, so all you have to do is go into Fort River or Wildwood and walk around for a while and you probably get form some opinion of what you think of the buildings. Um, and so, uh, so if, if in... My, I'm, I just been saying this because for the public, if if some process we went through made it clear that the only viable way to move forward with improving our facilities was to have two smaller or so-called neighborhood buildings, and that's the only pragmatic way that I can get to a point where, gosh darn it, I am working with all of you to get new facilities for students, then okay, let's figure out a way to do that too. I want to make sure we get this done. However, having said that, I think the only way to realistically get there in four or five years, six years, is in fact to talk about it in that context. Anyways, sorry. So I'm to gonna go off on that no, again. that's that's fine. I mean, I, I just want to I want to move us along because yes. I do think we we need to get a, a date on the books um, so that we can help share that um, the community as wide as possible and then move on to our agenda <laughs> items. Um, so looking at the calendar. Uh, January 7th is a Monday. Is that something that uh, could work for folks? <clears throat> yes, for me. Yes. Sorry, what? January 7th, Monday. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Could work for me. Yes. Excellent. He gave a thumbs up. <laughs> Great. Who did? Mr. Dumbling. Oh, good for you. <laughs> I'm saving my voice for the... He's uh, saving his he didn't voice. just say yes. You were kind of enthusiastic about it. Enthusiastic about it. So, um, and I guess we can, uh, Ms. Westmoreland, if we could just put that out there and ask Ms. Spitzer if, that's a, if that date might work for her. But if it works for everyone else here, I'm inclined to maybe at least tentatively put that on the books. And um, I think that might be the easiest meeting we've ever scheduled. Did you, did you say a time? Uh, Six o'clock. Okay. That's our normal time. That's what I was assuming anyway, unless. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Monday, January 7th. Mm -hmm. Great. We're good. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a really important uh, conversation, um, and I think we do have to give it as much time as it requires. 
uh, but we also do have other business matters that we have I to I won't talk anymore. Of, so. You're looking yeah, at you me. Can, no, I was looking at Dr. Morris. <laughs> Sorry, God. Yes, so we can move on. Okay, so Actually, moving us along. Uh, location of meetings. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to. This, is, this next topic is all yours. So. <laughs> Well, so this is just a continuation of the conversation that we started at our last meeting, uh, which is really, and I think this can be actually a very quick item unless folks have burning uh, questions or concerns, but um, at the last meeting we had talked about uh, the request that's been put out there, or suggestion anyway by the town, that we might be able to move our uh, school committee meetings from this location to the Amherst Town Hall. Uh, moving forward and the, the primary reason given has been that the town hall is actually undergoing a lot of construction and um, the town meeting room has been sort of brought up to date including new technology that would allow us to broadcast and uh, share these meetings uh, both uh, through television but also online uh, more easily and then there's just you know a lot of other issues that have been discussed which is accessibility and you know uh, transportation you know the, the fact that most people know where town government usually takes place and you know so the town hall is sort of a natural place for that. Um, I think on the other side we've also heard uh, here from the committee some members express concerns that leaving the schools you know the schools feel kind of cozy and that it's a lot easier for uh, community members anyway to um, relate the school committee proceedings and meetings to this location or a school location versus going to town hall. Um, and then also town hall can be kind of intimidating, uh, generally speaking. So I think we've, we've discussed and heard all of that. At the end of our last meeting, when we talked about this topic, uh, the committee had instructed me to go talk with Mr. Uh, Jim Lescote, who's the executive director of Amherst Media. And so I had a conversation with him about this topic and just to you know get some thoughts from him about uh, what his preference or Amherst Media's preference would be, if any. And, you know, frankly, I think Amherst Media is, is willing to do anything that we want them to do or need them to do. Um, however, he was very clear with me that the technology in that room will actually improve the experience for um, a lot of our viewers and community members. Um, we have also been having a lot of technical issues in this room. You know, a couple of the cameras haven't been working for quite some time, but even prior to that, there was just the uh, problems that a lot of uh, Amherst Media staff and interns encounter with lack of accessibility and communication yeah. with the Amherst Media um, office and you know the headquarters. Um, and there's a lot of technical glitches and things that have been going on for years, not just since this past summer. So I think you know from a feasibility or technical feasibility uh, perspective, the move to town hall you know would be easier on, on a lot of a lot of folks. So I think that you know the, the question to the committee at this point is, um, you know, now that you've had some time to think about this and, and reflect on it, if there is, you know, if you've sort of landed differently from where you were before, another idea that's that's also been put out there that I'm going to share is that maybe we just give it a try at town hall, uh, just to see what it's like. Um, they're not quite ready to go yet. I think that they're still kind of working out some of the kinks and the, con but but, you know, conceivably at our next scheduled meeting, which is uh, one, the one before we scheduled tonight, which is January 22nd, um, we could actually try a meeting there and see what it, what it feels like and you know what the response is from the community. Um, and if it's positive, then maybe we want to keep it there. And if not, then we can certainly come back here. But at least it gives us a little bit of a, you know, an opportunity to try new digs and see what happens. So I'll stop talking now. This is just sort of a very, like I said, I think a pretty quick issue, but just want to get the committee's response to to that. Mr. Dunley? Yeah, I, I think there is nothing to be lost and everything to be gained from from testing it out and trying it out. A trial I mean, run? The, yeah, I, well, it's, I, you know, I mean, I still sort of share the same concerns to varying levels about the atmosphere and how it's conducive to conversation and, and also what the experience is of, of people coming to public comment, as Ms. Menachie even talked about before. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, but this I'm really just projecting what that difference would be. So why not have direct evidence and then be able to compare it? You know, we could we could even have as the last item on the agenda. Okay, so how <laughs> how was it? We could even have a little public comment at the end if we wanted to, to people to say how was your public comment? Was it more or less intimidating? <laughs> Same order of magnitude of intimidation, <laughs> right? right. Um, so I mean, I just think you know having some evidence uh, is you know this can only help. 
Mr. And if they're too intimidated at the end to answer, we'll have a really, <laughs> we'll really know that it was a disaster. Uh, no, I, I, I'm okay with doing it. Um, I, I was, I mean, it's, um, it's a different meeting, but I was actually completely startled that members of school committee at the regional level from other towns didn't couldn't care less if we were in Amherst, <laughs> which which meant that which meant that I was like significantly more politically sensitive to their potential feelings of, ex, you know, exclusion mm -hmm. or alienation than they were. And I'm like, so what do I know, right? <laughs> it's like, well, what do I care? Uh, no, I, I think it's a good thing to do. I actually, I want to pick up on something, though, that Ms. McDonald said last time. I'm not holding you to it if you change your mind. Yep. <laughs> but you said it last time, and I agreed with it strongly, that I'm, I'm perfectly happy if we move to the um, town hall to do our meetings. But I think it means we should get that feedback, continually mm -hmm. listen to mm -hmm. how the staff and the community feel about it. And I also think we should make a point of setting up other meetings, or even occasional school committee meetings, that then occur out in our elementary schools and go out where the people are mm -hmm. and have meetings there. Yeah. I agree on the trial. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Dr. Morris. So I don't, you could tell me to stop me if I'm going to a place that uh, talks about other committees, but I think it is worth noting um, that because there's a presentation about the uh, ADA audit on the 22nd, another nice it would be a nice opportunity to actually for regional members and Pelham members as well as Amherst members to see how that works in, in a larger environment because there'll be more committee members at the beginning of that meeting than just the five mm -hmm. Amherst members. Um, so it, it gives us actually a little bit of sense of the large group and small group. And, you know, I think it's a particularly good meeting, perhaps, if we're going to try one, to try that one. Because it's just, this space is going to be a little hard for the beginning of that meeting. I'm sold. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So hearing consensus generally on the committee, um, I think let's, let's try it, right? June 20, or January 22nd. Um, and I'll follow up on arranging Great. That. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Morris. Thank you, everybody. Okay, uh, so the next item on the agenda is the uh, Regionalization School Committee Composition Elections uh, discussion. So, Mr. Demling, I'm looking to you. Fire up your spreadsheets. Here we go. <laughs> We're going to get going. wonky. <laughs> All right. So, uh, my uh, standard issue is 30-second intro. What is the Regional School District Planning Board? So, Amherst has a pre-K to 6 school district. That's our, us. Pelham also has one. Uh, and so, we are exploring the possibility of becoming one unified school district. We already share Dr. Morris and other central office services through Union 26, um, but this would formalize that. We would be one school committee, one budget, etc. And so there's a number of um, issues to untangle and so uh, and, and work through towards exploring what the pros and cons are and then making a general recommendation and what have you. Um, so uh, we are a, a six-member board, three members from Pelham, three members from Amherst. Uh, Mary Lou Tileman is, is here. She's a member of the uh, Amherst uh, Regional School District Planning Committee. See, so those two committees form the board, uh, and we are we are knee deep in um, going through all these issues. So our general approach, uh, because the, a regional agreement is a fairly complicated document, the ultimate document that you would have to write in, in detail form, and uh, and that's actually what you vote on in, in the public, um, has many different sections. So we're, our, our general approach is going to break down these sections. Uh, collect all the information, and so we have uh, consultants we're working with from um, Mass Association Regional Schools, Mars, um, to help us work through this. Collect all the information, identify the pros and cons, um, and then present that to the public and the groups for feedback, um, and, that, and have that feedback help us make a general recommendation about whether we should move forward or not. So we are nowhere near a point of general recommendation of regionalizing. We're not recommending a formal we have no formal recommendation about a, what the school committee composition or election mechanism should be at this point. We are at the point of identifying pros and cons. And what we thought, since we are so knee deep in this particular issue at the moment, uh, we've met on it several times, uh, why not meet with the school committees and, and hear what they have to say? Um, so a, a few sort of meta points before we go through the, the five uh, legal options, that uh, any one of which satisfies the requirement for a regional school committee. Um, so um, th this general theme keeps popping up, and if, if you're a, a veteran of the um, uh, discussion slash debate about the nature of Amherst Town Government, you'll, this will be very familiar to you. What is representation? And so uh, the way that this manifests itself in these different options are um, how do voters participate in elections? Which elections do they participate in? How many are there? Um, 
how many voices are there at the table, uh, how many votes are there at the table. So that's usually a one-to-one -one correspondence, but with uh, concepts of weighted voting that we'll get into a little later on, that's not always the case. Um, and also, how easy is the electoral process and the governance process to understand? Some of these are more complicated than others, and so that could be a pro or con in terms of the public understanding their representation. Um, in terms of the number of members, so we haven't had a deep dive discussion where we're evaluating every single number from one till infinity. Um, I will say we've, we've sort of just taken seven as, as our standard example in order to run through options, and that's because um, one of the big issues to consider when coming up with the school committee composition for our particular two towns is we have a region. <laughs> and there are five Amherst members and two Pelham members uh, at the regional school committee. And so the simplest appointment mechanism for a future Amherst and Pelham pre-K to six region would be to simply have all of those members um, go up to the region. You can uh, have less or more. If you, had le if you had less than five Amherst members, you would need an additional mechanism to appoint the, uh, the additional members to the region. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, and there is precedence for this, um, so that's what Pelham does right now. The Pelham School Committee uh, appoints their membership to the region. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had more, you would have to have some way for the regional school committee to uh, select among its, its own members uh, its membership to the, the, top, the top region. Um, so I, th I think um, it would be a little funky to think about something less than five. A school committee of one through four seems rather unconventional. Um, more than seven, it doesn't seem like there's a great reason for that, uh, but we haven't completely excluded that. So um, my, my thinking, I think five, six, seven range is, is sort of the number. Um, yeah, and um, one of the things, so when we're talking about votes and, and what they control, so typically we're talking about uh, regular school committee, this is like what we're doing here now. Um, you can write into a regional agreement special exceptions um, for uh, whatever you want. And so uh, the common example that's come up in our discussions is uh, if there's a vote on, say, the future of the Pelham Elementary building, you could potentially write in that says, um, all votes of, for the future of this building require a majority or all of the Pelham representatives, for example. So you can sort of, sort of override the default uh, system uh, into a regional agreement. But uh, other than that, that, this is just for the general um, conversation. Okay, so there's five conditions. Uh, and any one of these can be satisfied in order to be a legal uh, option. So this is the, um, the two-page governance issues document. And so uh, an analogous to the, um, the draft materials that we saw from the Port River Committee earlier in the meeting. So this is a, a working, kind of evolving document. So we have a discussion. We ask some clarifying questions. Mars then goes up, back up and, and updates this and, mm -hmm. and gets some information from Desi, updates and articulate that. And so this is a in-process um, document. Um, so I want to start with option five, because it's the easiest to uh, explain and, um, and evaluate. So option five, in order to, this, so this is the method of selecting the members to the committee, is simply appointment by some government body. So in Amherst, this might be the town council, or mm -hmm. Pelham, this might be the town meeting. Um, advantages are the simplest. <laughs> Disadvantages is that there's no voter involvement. Um, our initial discussions on our board is that uh, we feel that having no voter involvement runs completely counter to the <laughs> prevailing sentiments in our towns, but we want to sort of, this is a legal option. Uh, we don't think it, it would have really much traction in our communities to have a school committee where the voters aren't having a say in who's on the committee directly. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry Mr. Dillon, just to, to interrupt for a second though, I, I'm sorry, maybe I'm misunderstanding, mm -hmm. but these would be, so while they're appointed to the region, they would still be elected school committee members. Is that right? No, so no. this would be, so, um, so the wording in this document is a little, is a little confusing. This says such as school board members, so that's why I'm asking for the clarification. So such as school board members would be, for example, the Pelham case. So in Pelham oh. Elementary, they're, they're um, if, I'm, if I'm correct, Dr. Morris, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. their, their elementary members are elected, and then the members to the 712 region are appointed. Right, but I'm saying the initial, they, they are initially elected, right? Can I try to offer clarification? So, um, so the five Pelham School Committee members are elected by the voters, mm -hmm. and then from those five, there's an election of the school committee is the only voters to select the two members who are then the regional representatives. I, so, yeah, so that's consistent with this. So to, yeah. to, I think to clarify for our conversation, you could probably just tr strike such as school board members and, and, and insert such as town council members. 
So this is, so you can appoint committee members by locally elected officials. So by locally elected officials who are not school committee. So they, they have the option to uh, appoint elected officials who are not school committee members, but who still have been selected by voters. No, no, no. So, okay. so, so, here's, so here's, here's an example. Um, uh, we, we were not, I'm sorry, not to the region though. What I'm saying mm -hmm. is initially, yes. the first barrier is right. actually appointed or elected by voters. Is it doing this? Yeah. I'm so in, in Boston, the mayor appoints the school committee. Right. In this case, the town council would appoint the school committee. Mm -hmm. So there would be no vote by people townwide. Yes, that's what I mean. Maybe, okay, that's yeah, what you're that's, saying, yes, right? That's what I'm saying. Well, that's what you're saying. So, that's yes. my, I guess my, so what I understood was that the uh, town of Pelham would elect school committee members to the Pelham School Committee. And then the regional committee would be appointed. Is I, that I is think, that not the I case think, at all? I think the situation no. is isn't if this is, if you're talking about the regional school district committee for Amherst and Pelham Elementary School mm -hmm. school elementary schools, mm -hmm. there would be no Pelham Elementary Elementary School committee, and there would be no Amherst Elementary yeah. School so the committee. Are completely those okay. those those will, I just, once yeah. we once the region is formed. Yeah. Those committees will no longer exist, and there only will be that one regional school committee yeah. for Amherst and Pelham Elementary Schools. And what you're saying is, just tell me if I'm wrong, yeah. what you're saying is option five, and there are four other options, yes. which means we could move on to those. I thought this was the simplest one. <laughs> that, well, that, it was just clarification, that right? For the but fifth, fifth sure option, you're saying, so you're saying basically like the town manager or the select board of Pelham might appoint the school committee members for Pelham, and the town council or conceptually, the town manager would appoint the school committee members for the town of Amherst? Yes. Okay. So, so would, would appoint, so in, in this, this new, let's call it the, uh, it's a little confusing with the names because we have the Amherst Pelham School Committee. Let's call it the Amherst and Pelham Elementary Region. Okay, well, so say it's, it's seven members, five from Amherst. So those five from Amherst members would be, would be appointed by some other government body. You would write that into the regional agreement and say the town council of Amherst has the authority to appoint the Amherst members and the Pelham Town Meeting has the authority to appoint the, the Pelham members. In other words, so as an Amherst voter, you're voting for the Town Council. No, I get it now. Yeah. I just right. wanted yep. to clarify from, you know, the, the initial yep. barrier is what yep. I was, yeah, thank yep. you. Okay, so that's that option. Um, so because there's not direct voting, our, our feeling was that was the big con, mm -hmm. but, um, but just to put it out there as a legal option. Um, so the next, hopefully simple, <laughs> um, option to explain is option number one. So electing committees by voters in member communities with each community representing a portion according to population. So there's a concept um, in these discussions called one person, one vote. Um, it's a little confusing to explain, but it's basically the principle that there can't be more than a 10% difference between how many people each school committee vote represents. So for example, let's, let's say that um, Amherst had 50,000 people in town and Pelham had 20,000 people. If there were five people from Amherst and two people from Pelham in that town, each one of those members, assuming they have one vote, is representing 10,000 people. So 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, everything's nice and even. That's, that's allowable under this according to population, if, if that, that, those are the populations. If, if Pelham was 19,000, it would still be within that 10% variance, and so it's, it's good. Um, the, uh, the issue with, uh, with Amherst and Pelham is that Pelham is so much smaller. So using the numbers from the 2010 census, Amherst is 39,833 and Pelham is 1,130. So Amherst is 35 times the size of Pelham. Um, and so if you, if you were to try and construct a, a seven-member school committee with five members from Amherst and two from Pelham, the percentage is the number of people who each of those members are representing is, is wildly um, different. Does that make sense in terms of violating this principle of one person, one vote? Yes. How do, how do we get away with that on the uh, secondary district? Because there's nothing <laughs> like that for the secondary district. So I this would say that's a good question that is probably best discussed at region. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Well, it's, I wasn't. It's, it's a very good natural question. I mean, no, but, but I was. I wasn't asking it to debate whether. Forgive me, if you're. I wasn't asking whether the regional school committee is legal. <laughs> I was. 
<laughs> so I'll just drop the question. <laughs> I could say more on it, but it's it's uh it's 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 more relevant to the to the region, I think. <laughs> I have a question, but I'm yeah. gonna hold it. So if if you wanna, unless anyone yeah, else. Um, yeah. Um. So so you can if if you were to try and construct based on our populations, the uh, a school committee that was um, that passed this option one according to population, you could do it, but you would have a 34 member school committee. Mm -hmm. You would have 33 people from Amherst and one person from Pelham. So the con is that that's pretty unwieldy <laughs> and impractical, but you could do it if, if that was if your I appreciate the uh, <laughs> thoroughness of this <laughs> mutualization committee to include all the options, even the ones that are not viable for. Yes. <laughs> Please continue, Mr. Okay, Dunlick. so that's, that's it for option one. I'll move on to, I'm going to take option two and three together, because option three is a variant of option two. So option two and three is essentially district-wide or region-wide elections where candidates run and are voted on by um, members, uh, voters in both towns at the same time. So there would be a number of candidates running and the candidates that Pelham sees the same that, uh, that Amherst sees and you, and you vote on them and that number is elected to the committee. Every person has one vote and that's, that's in the um, MGL requirements that satisfies this one person, one vote mm -hmm. um, principle. Um, the, According to the requirement, it is required to happen at the biennial state elections. So on the same cycle that the, um, the town council and the future Amherst School Committee, barring this, <laughs> are on. Um, or by other special legislation. I think if, if you're familiar with the town charter discussions before, you, you can do it, but it requires special legislation mm -hmm. every time. To, if you want to have a vote um, at the same time as a federal uh, election. Um, so pros to this um, approach is that every voter has a say in every candidate. Um, so candidates have to campaign in both towns, right? And so um, even though Pelham is very tiny, you get to um, opine on every person that, that goes on the committee. Um, it's pretty simple to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and it, it, it supports any number of, of uh, committees. So if you wanted it to be seven, you, you, you could do that. Um, cons. Um, uh, is a if there are if you don't go with option three, which adds an additional residency requirement to a number of the members, you could get in, you need to add some additional mechanism for potentially for appointing members to the region because you could potentially end up with say a five member or a seven member or a six member co committee that's all Amherst residents and then so Pelham needs its its uh, uh, representation at, at the region. Um, it's. Uh, so a pro or con, depending on, on how you think about it, is that uh, it because of, of when the elections need to happen, it's either a two-year or four-year overlapping terms. Um, and so this is another point I should bring up, uh, just come up a little bit, is that um, you know to have four-year overlapping terms um, you, um, may make you think that this this is so this is different than what's currently in the Amherst Town Charter, which is the entire school committee is up every two years. And so, and so that's true, and and that's because the, a new region is actually a new legal entity, mm -hmm. and so it sets its own electoral um, rules and cycles and and whatnot. So uh, you know it has to be according to one of these options. That's why we're discussing them, uh, but it's it's essentially decoupled from um, from that that requirement in the, in the town charter. We haven't. That's been our assumption. We haven't you know delved deeply into getting actual legal guidance on is that actually the case. But if we get you know if we journey further down to that road. That would, you know, we would want that confirmation. Um, another con is that there could be a potentially hard to resolve complication uh, because uh, Pelham has a different voting mechanism than what Amherst is going to have in the future. So which the Ranked Choice Voting Committee just um, started up at the town council. Um, and so uh, you can't go to one booth in Amherst and rank choice the vote of the candidates and then go to Pelham and not have ranked choice. You'd have to have some sort of resolution. And so we would have to think through if this was the preferred option, what, what we would want that to be. Um, and you know, there's different issues of you know, voter confusion and uh, whether that's a you know, good thing or bad thing to decouple and whatnot, but those, this is some of the pros and cons to consider. Um, some others. Um, so we mentioned the, this potential regional complication if there's, a, there's not a residency uh, requirement. Okay, any questions on options two and three? Okay, um, 
we went to the last one, so weighted voting. So one person, one vote. Um, so you can achieve that either by having 34 member school committee, or you can have a more reasonably sized school committee, but then weight the votes differently. So that, um, so that the larger towns, so the Amherst members in this case, have a higher number of votes than, than the Pelham members. And so by, and if you do that, you can satisfy the state requirement of one person, one vote. Um, so this, this spreadsheet is a little hard to interpret, but they give, there's one example that, um, in this working document, the center packet, consultants gave us of a, if you had a seven person school committee with five from Amherst and two from Pelham, if you gave 10 votes to each Amherst member and two and uh, three quarters of a vote to each Pelham member, then that works out to 51 and a half votes and because of the way the populations are, it satisfies that uh, requirement. It's not, the number of votes are not uh, that far off in terms of the, the number of population it represents. So um, pros are that you, you satisfy the, the requirement. Um, it, you can make these models work for, I, you know, I've plugged in different weighted models for five or six or seven, uh, and you can get it to work. Um, uh, some, so some cons um, are that because the, the difference between Pelham and Amherst are so large, um, for all intents and purposes, the weights don't have any meaningful value. So, for example, uh, in the case of a seven-person school committee member where there's um, ten votes for each Amherst member and three-quarters of a vote for each Pelham member, there's, there's no combination of votes where those Pelham votes ever change the vote. It's, it's as if their votes are zero. Right? And so, it, so, so technically you can still do it because you can run the math and the state will sign off on it but those votes actually never come into play. Now, you can make, you know, an, uh, 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 on the flip side, there's two seats at the table for Pelham, and so there's, there's meaning, this comes back to the idea of representation, right? If you don't actually have votes that are carrying weight, with the exception of any exceptions you write into the regional agreement, um, what's, you know, is, is there representation? You know? So that another, if you have seats at the table, you're obviously part of the discussion, and most votes aren't that contentious anyway. Um, so, it, it, and it's the same thing with, with six or with, with seven, if you have, um, it's the, uh, the Amherst members are always going to, you're always going to need a majority of Amherst members, and the, the Pelham votes are never going to, going to swing. So we go, except for, <laughs> the last case if you, is if you had a five-person committee, um, you'd still have the complication, if, if you had four votes, four members from Amherst and one from Pelham, um, the Pelham vote would be worth one, the Amherst votes would be worth nine, and that Pelham vote could swing the, a 2-2 two -two tie. So that's the one case in which a Pelham vote could have potential potential meaning. Yes, Mr. Dr. Jim. So uh, thank you. Um, no, I mean it's it's like a Rubik's cube, <laughs> verbal, verbal Rubik's cube. Um, so for the option five, if you're appointing the members from each town, can you do a straight five and two, or does that have to also be weighted by by population, or because it's being appointed by the elected officials, can they just pick a number that seems reasonable to them? Mr. That's a good question. Now, we have, because we have not dove deeply into that possibility, we have not asked our consultants the question. So we could, could find, more, find out more about that, what the requirements are. Mr. Nagarjuna. I think the other options sound so convoluted or undesirable that it's probably worth actually asking that question. Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, since I was wrong about the televised school committee meetings in the venue, you know, I have no clue whether people in Pelham care whether they ever elect another school committee member again. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be facetious or sarcastic about the effort. This is a super important discussion, but I'm I'm just assuming that in the same way that the question of the future of the Pelham Elementary School as a building and a building location for children who are born and raised in Pelham or raised in Pelham is like a super, I would assume is a super important thing to the community. I think I'd imagine knowing whether they're ever going to have another meaningful vote again on a school committee would probably be a reasonable question. I mean, you know, worth answering. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morris? As someone who happened to attend a meeting in Pelham where this very same handout was discussed, I think in this case you're accurately reading the feelings that I heard expressed by Pelham elected officials. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spot on. <laughs> um, so I don't know if there's members of that committee that you would like to 
provide an opportunity to provide some input yeah, at there this are. point? Would, would, or would that be okay with the chair? It's fine with me if it's okay with the committee. And yeah, I think sure. for, for this case, it so, makes um, sense so given if, uh, the complexity. If there are any members of the uh, planning board who would like you, so you have to come up to the mic. Microphone. Please come to the microphone, Miss. Yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean, if, if you don't mind, just because <laughs> other people may want to hear that too. Oh, okay. We want everybody to benefit from your input. Oh. <laughs> I think we have to check with Mars, but I believe all five of these options are residency based because the, the regional agreement states the towns that will be involved, just as our four towns with 712. This would be Amherst Pelham, and the one person, one vote would apply, I believe, to all of those five options. So we need to check with Mars, but, but that's the idea. And that's the law, actually. And, and <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're getting some help, don't worry. <laughs> For Amherst Media Art, Mark Morris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have, I have some thoughts and questions as well. But um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because it, it's, uh, it, there are really just a lot of convoluted little details that, mm -hmm. that you're considering with all of this. And of course, I appreciate that it has to be that way. At the same time, it's, it's, uh, it really is a lot to wrap your, your brain around. Uh, so I think for me, um, just initial reactions, I feel like, you know, again, I was, I was being a little facetious before, but, you know, if there's an option that really is just so far out of... <laughs> possibility, we probably should just take that out of the running completely. I mean, it sounds like uh, option one, uh, given the disparity of the populations, is just not really something we should even be considering, right? I feel, it feels almost, uh, I mean, I get why it would be on this list, um, but I think just in order to have a more sort of, you know, robust conversation, I guess, and, and be most transparent uh, in terms of what we're actually considering, that it feels like this should probably just be taken off, but it's just, it's just for the committee to, to think about. Um, I think for, for option two and therefore three, uh, you know, I heard you say before, uh, sort of a, with a little bit of a question about whether the region is its own legal entity. Um, I definitely think we, I would also second that we need to get legal advice. It, it feels like the right time to do that and to just, you know, get um, you know, an actual answer to, to that question. Yeah, so, um, so we have... I uh, had a number of questions go through Amherst Town Council, um, more specifically related to another subtopic that we can talk about another time, which is what's the potential impact at the 712 region, because this is just one of the impacts. Yeah. Um, uh, so can you, so I, I mean, I know that a region is its own separate legal entity, but like, like so specifically, like what would, just so I get your question, like right. Well, you, what, I think your, your almost exact quote was, we're pretty sure that it's its own legal entity. Okay. <laughs> so maybe you were just, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. In any case, mm -hmm. I think just being very clear on, yeah, yeah. on some of these initial or very basic questions would be helpful. Uh, and this is just my feedback, right? Okay. So, you know, um, take it or leave it. I think uh, for option two, uh, my concerns there would be um, under disadvantages, the allowing for the disproportional representation and the, uh, the elections every other year. Um, that feels like it might be... Uh, really difficult in Amherst with town council elections. Um, I just feel like we, we, I, I would like to better understand exactly how that might work. Maybe it's a model you know, that we look at and just see play out with the numbers. What, but just what, given what option, number? option two. Uh, so just, you know, I, I would like some more clarification on how that works with our town council elections. Uh, regardless of the region being its own legal entity, just in terms of feasibility for our voters, you know, how they might be able to, to hook into this process. Um, it feels like we need to have some clarity around that. Um, and then on option four, the, I think that my, my initial reaction to this one is that um, the, you know, the one vote uh, representation it's almost like a pact that we've made with voters, right? That, you know, you vote for somebody and your vote counts as a vote and it gets counted and tallied up at the end. And for there to be any votes weighted more than others, it feels like it could, I, I see one of two things potentially happening. Uh, 
a disin disincentivization of regionalization, period, because I think people would wonder, well, then why would we even want to do something like that if our votes aren't going to be counted, potentially? Um, but also, I think even when, once we get into it, if we were to adopt this, that people might feel like their votes just don't matter, right? And it's so difficult to get people to the polling place mm -hmm. as it is and to get them to vote that to then add this layer of, well, you know, your votes are going to be 1 50th of one, one vote, uh, or even just trying to calculate what that might be like. And, and I'm trying, I'm thinking of our, a lot of our new voters, right, that we're constantly trying to get, you know, out to explain that fairly difficult concept um, and why that is. I mean, I get, again, the justification for it, but, you know, my initial reaction to that is I would love to hear feedback from folks whose job it is to, to turn out the vote uh, and to see if they've ever had any experience with something like this and if it feels like it's just, you know, too difficult a concept for people to grab onto that maybe... Uh, I, I'm not sold on that idea, especially in light, again, of the difference in size between our two communities, right? There is such a huge difference in weight, potentially, between those votes that it feels almost insincere to, to you know, put something out there. Um, so as an option, I, actually, I think it's one of my least favorites uh, for that reason. But in any case, I mean, I, I appreciate, again, the level of complexity and detail that, that you're grappling with as a committee around uh, this question. Um, I do think, again, helpful to get some, you know, some legal advice on some of these and uh, just to continue thinking and getting feedback, you know, from community around, around those specific questions would be helpful for me. Ms. McDonald and Mr. Nakajima? It's just a question because I, I, either you went really quickly through number three or I um, zoned out mm -hmm. and apologize. But um, <laughs> so when it says it's the same as option two, um, but with residency requirements, is that, do I understand that correctly that it's similar to the Amherst Town Council where you have at large and, and district? So you'd have everybody votes, but you're going to vote for two people from Pelham and five people from Amherst? Mr. Dunley? Yeah, pretty much. So okay. everybody, yes. So you'd have um, yeah, candidates that are running from Pelham and from Amherst for a specific number of uh, seats, of seats mm -hmm. as defined. So the regional agreement would define these number of seats for Pelham, these number of seats for, for Amherst. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so that's, that's another way to get to the your votes matter mm -hmm. um, uh, with, with residency requirements. Um, e even from, even, you could even combine it with, with, with waiting, I suppose, although I might get a little wonky. Um, but you can imagine a seven-person council, a uh, council committee with uh, with one or two people defined from Pelham. Um, but you, I just wanted to say that, like, I think you hit the nail on the head with with the concerns about waiting. Not that I'm expressing a, an opinion pro or con waiting at this mm -hmm. point, but um, uh, essential to a lot of these issues is is that Pelham is so much smaller than, than Amherst. And so, how do you how do you create a structure that's legal <laughs> and yet still representative? Right, and that's palpable to both communities. Um, it was it was somewhat interesting to me that you could do a a five person committee with one where you had nine awaited nine votes for each Amherst member, and then one poem member that had one vote where it's it could still have some meaning. <laughs> you could break that tie, um, but again, it's 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 explaining to to be, not only people understanding that, but feeling like it has has a difference, and it's yeah. it's worth it. Right, Mr. Nakajima. Um, you were so thoughtful that I felt like I needed to say something more thoughtful. Um, I was just confused. I, I feel I feel shamed <laughs> into making a more thoughtful comment than I was previously. Um, just my, my feedback. I mean, first off, uh, I think doing weighted votes is going to end up being politically unpalatable and convoluted. Uh, and so, I mean, so I know you're on, you're the chair and on the committee, so you have to be really neutral and thoughtful and fact-seeking right now. <laughs> Since I'm not, I can just say what I think. Um, so I'm just going to say what I think. I think it's a terrible idea, and I think in the end, it'll have a lot of the problems that the chair just spoke about over time. You'll have diminished engagement around it. My guess is you're right. You hinted at that you thought that option five wouldn't be politically palatable to the communities because voters would be cut out, um, except for indirectly, through electing their principal um, officials. If, if I'm not saying you can get around one person, one vote, but if those if those delegates represent the town as opposed to the individuals in the town as corporate entities, I don't know if that means you can do 
five and two or one and five or one and four, uh, that's based on, based on legal advice. If you can't, based on one person, one vote, then I think similarly that is like a couple strikes against it, right? You're not going to get enough very many people in it, and it cuts out the voters, which means to me you're really left with um, option two or option three. And that means either, and, and you know, it's, and it's unpalatable and unfortunate in some ways. Almost option three becomes the default, in my mind, the default scenario, because it's the one that at least respects the idea that you know for a fact you're going to get an elected representative for who happens to reside in both towns. And so you can, which, is an, which I think is an important principle, and that they have an equal vote when it's all said and done. Um, option two, is unfortunately there's some people who say, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, but there's some people who have often talked about Pelham as being um, as independent as it is, a highly desirable suburb or, or neighborhood within the town of Amherst, not literally but figuratively. Um, and I think moving toward option two is making it more, more literal than figurative that essentially is just a really nice part of the corporate town of Amherst Pelham. Uh, you know, and, and I don't, again, I, I imagine people in Pelham would have really hard feelings about that, which pushes you to three. But good luck, because <laughs> I know you're still at this. <laughs> Mr. Dunley. Well, I should say, if the committee, if the planning board ultimately recommends regionalization, the, the task would fall to, well, I mean, it would fall to us, but the Amherst School Committee and the Pelham School Committee would be heavily involved in Draft, you know, helping draft the uh, details of the regional agreement. So <laughs> you're not off the hook if we, uh, <laughs> if we go forward with that. So um, thank you for this, Mr. Dumling. And uh, so I'm wondering, you know, this is obviously you mentioned that you, you hinted at, uh, you know, additional items that are going to come before this committee hmm. to, for consideration discussion. Um, I'm assuming next steps are just we're going to continue hearing some of the things that you're grappling with and continue providing some feedback when appropriate, right, for, the, for you to take back, is that right? Yes, yeah, so so I, sh I should say, so we're, we're planning pu public forum. So we've, we've uh, contracted with a, a public engagement consultant that we're all very happy with, and it's gonna be running four public forums early next year, so we're still trying to nail down the dates, but um, two, two in Pelham, two in Amherst, different times, um, as, as a informational, you know, community output. Is that outreach. in January, or is? Potentially in January, okay. yes. Um, it, it really depends on scheduling uh, uh, information we, we get back in the next few weeks. Um, another important milestone um, is a week from Friday at our December 28th meeting. Tentatively, we have our financial consultant, Mark Abrahams, presenting the results of his financial analysis. And so this will be the, what is it, you know, the, that detailed deep dive from the regionalization expert about how does the regional transportation reimbursement and the operational budget and even MSBA reimbursement potentially factor into all this in terms of the financial benefit of those. So that'll be a very important piece. Um, and depending on what comes out of that, you know, I think that would be something that I would want to share and you know, have our committee discuss um, as soon after that's presented. So. Great. Great. Okay. Well, this sounds wonderful. Um, I think as soon as you get those dates for those forums, if you can share that with the committee, um, that would be helpful so that we can help spread the word here in Amherst and even in Pelham. Uh, to the degree possible, and then um, I think looking to our next agenda, you know, we can get on there. That'd be great just to hear back from the consultants and everyone. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sure. So, um, is the committee up for a quick break? Sure. Yep. Can I get a motion? I'm Move to break, just briefly. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima. <laughs> Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, so maybe just a two-minute break? Yeah. So uh, all those in favor? Okay, we'll take a two-minute break. Oh, yeah. Calling meeting back to order at 9.06 p.m. The next item on the agenda is a dual language program update. Dr. Morris. And I will try to be brief. Um, lots of good, exciting things, but I'll try to do them succinctly. Um, so just uh, we've got seven things, and I'm just going to roll through them and see if there's questions at the end. Um, so we applied for a grant in collaboration with the Holyoke Public Schools. The state put out a grant that was after the Look Act was passed, although the grant didn't come out to this fall, to support districts who are implementing dual language programs. Um, there was a minimum 
number of English learners as a requirement to be an applicant, but collaboratives were allowed. So Holyoke, since they just started their second program, we worked with them and UMass as a common university partner. So we submitted that grant on December 4th, and we find out on Thursday whether we received it. It would fund things just this winter and spring, but it would allow us to take, you know, some, some really active steps uh, on purchasing for multiple years and some of the other costs that we talked about a couple, I guess last month, uh, mm -hmm. um, be able to take kind of sort of progressive timelines on those as well as professional development for staff. So we'll let you know when we hear. Right. Um, but we're keeping our fingers crossed. It's, it's actually a fairly sizable grant, it's, it's, even though it, was, it would be shared with um, two districts if we were to get it. Um, uh, I talked earlier, as did Ms. Ordonez, about the Fort River family meeting um, that occurred on December 10th and continuing to gather feedback on that. Uh, Ms. Helfel was actually, the, I really didn't do in the update, the same day that the commissioner visited. So we didn't have time, but actually the principal was hoping to be able to mention that and just we got off on other topics and kids were engaging and that was a good use of the commissioner time and our time as well. But um, successful meeting. Uh, one of the best parts of my week last week is uh, we finally got to resolution, which we talked about the committee before, about working with Greenfield Community College on designing a uh, Spanish for Educators course. So we were hoping, you know, so Ms. Richards and I had a lot of conversation. We said, well, we'd love to do it for we'll prioritize Fort River families, you know, not to get into a whole lottery conversation, you know, but it did sort of mimic <laughs> some other conversations we've had. Um, and we... Um, put it out, we were hoping to fill, their, their ideal class size for beginners is about 15, and we have about 75 staff members across the districts who expressed interest, and not just the loose interest, because we had a date, a time, need to commit to come every Thursday from 3.45 to 5.30, you sign up at GCC, you get credits, this isn't like a casual drop in if you want to. So that's a great problem to have, it's a problem, but it's a great problem to have, so we're now in conversation with GCC about offering at least two sections, one specific to Fort River staff and prioritizing them because of the dual language program and one for some lottery system equitably for the other schools in the district. But uh, I'm just so encouraged by the broader staff in the district with so much interest. We also have a need for like an upper level class for staff who is either moderate or close to fluent but need, don't have opportunities to speak Spanish on a more regular basis. So we're trying to explore other possibilities of how to do that. And that may be a sort of next fall thing. It may not be GCCs, we're straining their capacity to ask them what we're doing now, but we are exploring. Um, there's also a, a group in Northampton, it's not a university, the International Language Institute, I believe is the name, um, and we're trying to reach out to other folks who might be able to assist us with this, but there's just strong interest for, for our staff on a variety of levels, of, who have a variety of levels of fluency in Spanish to have a real specific format. So, you know, just compliment our staff for their willingness to work an extra two hours a week, you know, uh, on top of their busy schedules, so it's outstanding. Um, <coughs> This is weekly emails that Ms. Richardson sends out. Um, there's a kind of the leadership planning team. And so, you know, for instance, there's a dual language special ed network meeting in late January that we're going to send a group to in Ashland. Um, that's all over New England. They get together to talk about how dual language programs best serve the needs of special education, students with special needs, and what's the interplay between that. Uh, Mabe and Phyllis are coming in early excuse me, early February to do some on-site PD uh, specific to kind of three topics. One is like the, the cultural aspect and how to weave the cultural aspect in. The second is um, kind of this special ed, ELL, this conundrum that she's worked with our staff long before there was dual language on the horizon, um, how to approach that, and, and then also on the curriculum front. So we have subgroups on this planning team and she's gonna then kind of address, you know, work throughout the day with all the subgroups. As was shared with the committee electronically, our initial feedback from the DESE application was incredibly positive. Not just the right boxes were checked, but there was a small narrative that expressed um, appreciation for the work that our team's doing on that. We are in the midst, I saw a draft yesterday or today, yesterday. Um, Mr. Takayama, who's a technology teacher at Fort River, is working with staff to create a video um, for the dual language program just to share it with the larger community. It has <coughs> students and staff in it. Um, Right now, it's it's you know it's narrowing it down. There's so much good footage that he's like four and a half minutes, and we're really looking for a shorter, tighter uh, video. But um, it's great that the staff is jumping in and trying to figure out ways that we can promote this to a larger community. Uh, we've posted the position, uh, the first position, which is the kindergarten teacher for the Spanish side of the dual language program. We posted it on a, <coughs> on a paid advertisement on Facebook. 
We put on Schoolspring and Indeed.com. We sent additional email to staff just talking about word of mouth, which has already <laughs> yielded a number of responses. Um, Mabe has posted it for us. We have been in contact with multiple universities in Puerto Rico, um, University of Puerto Rico, which has multiple campuses, and then also the Inter-American University, um, which is uh, also multiple campuses, the two main you know, higher education um, institutions that train teachers in Puerto Rico. Um, we were contacted by the Spanish Embassy, so they got wind of some of our posting information, and they do work with a number of districts in Massachusetts around, um, actually many of the districts in Massachusetts with dual language programs about supplying teachers and all that, and we're not committed to do that, to go that route, but the conversation would be useful, right? There's no point in closing doors. We're trying to keep them as open as they can. So they're actually willing to come out, someone from the consulate who does this sometime in mid-January, and I think Ms. Westmoreland's working on a date, actually, to talk about this. They were excited and wanted to talk to us about what they can provide. And the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Priegas, which is the main campus of the University of Puerto Rico, also has a job fair in March that um, they invited us, well, for a fee, to come to. Um, but it's something that we'll likely do. Even if we have our first teacher, what we're looking is how do we increase the number of bilingual staff in the district more generally? So even if we're like, oh yeah, we got it, we're, we're good to go, uh, we feel like it's good to make a relationship with the main campus. They, you know, it's, um, it's a highly respected institution, not that the others aren't, but it's in terms of academic preparedness, thought to be the highest on, in the Caribbean. Um, so I think we're gonna send I'm a team that may include me um, to go down for, it's gonna be a quick trip, but a day or two just to, to go with the feedback we've received already is that when you go to job fairs, the way it works, typically the people are hired there. It's not like, especially if it, because of the distance. So if Ms. Cunningham or I wasn't or there, it, it, we might not get the candidates and Ms. Cunningham I know can't go. So gosh darn it, I may have to go to Puerto Rico for a day or two. Not the worst thing in the world in March. Um, the last update I want to have is we'll we can come back in January to talk a little more details, but we've actually moved the registration deadline back a bit. Um, so later in March than we've had in the past. There was multiple reasons. Uh, one was just when you can do the banner downtown, which people actually do read, you know, um, and it was already booked for certain dates in early March. But more <laughs> relevant to this conversation, because we probably could have figured that out in another way, we want to give more time to have more information sessions in early March for families so when they get to registration, they've had more opportunities to interact with what the program is, how the lottery process works. It allows us then to push back our screening by a couple of weeks, which will, which gives us time to do our lottery, which we talked about the last time before the screening takes place. So we feel like we're lining things up. You know, we just got the registration dates, I think, settled yesterday. Um, so we're, you know, when we come back, I can kind of be more finite with here's the date of this, here's the date of that. But everything's kind of lining up pretty well for us. Um, you know, so I do think a topic on the January agenda, not the January 7th, but the January 22nd would be just fine tuning how we're thinking about the lottery. Um, how that process works and, and going into depth now that we've got some of the other details lined up. Thank you, Dr. Morris, uh, for that. Any questions from the committee for Dr. Morris? I'm just Should impressed how detailed it is. I appreciate the fact that uh, uh, particularly at this hour, the likelihood that I'm, in, I'm not done with the other committee members that I'm going to come up with a million great questions. <laughs> Uh, is low, so I'm grateful that you yourself were. It sure, I mean, what I like about it is when you're talking about the number of teams, the number of efforts, the number of functional areas that need to be worked on, you're hitting all the different elements, and I just appreciate that. Thank Very you. Nice. Mr. Dumlin. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like, do you have the quote from Desi about the preparedness response? Like, I thought, yeah. in terms of like my oversight role in the school committee in terms of the program, like, that was the most relevant piece of information that was so great to see that, like, oh, yes, all this qualitative mm -hmm. sense we've had that, that the program is being really well thought out and prepared for is, is actually objectively verified. It was, it was really nice to see. Yeah. I would second that. I think, yeah. you know, and, and we heard that from Mabe, I think, also earlier in the year. Um, I guess they're probably, you would expect it a little bit more from them than you would from Desi, but it's still nice to hear, yeah. nonetheless. Um, I have a couple of, of quick comments and questions. Oh, did you want to Yeah, I have the language, the and, and there's one other thing I meant to answer, meant to add that I didn't. So the comment was, um, the district's preliminary proposal indicates that the district plan for the new ELE program meticulously, and then it just has, you know, some more technical language, but I think that was the, the line. Um, the one thing I mentioned in terms of the position posted, we have also have ads going in La Vos and 
blank on the second publication, but two major Spanish language newspapers um, that are um, printed and shared in both Western Massachusetts and Northern Connecticut. Um, so we have ads that were sent out and there are ones going in, La Vos is going this week and then one week after break, the other one doesn't publish until after the, the holiday um, season ends. So those That's are also good. going out. Um, so I apologize, I didn't mention that earlier. That was actually related to one of my questions. Yeah. Uh, just uh, if you put Spanish language uh, publications yeah. or outlets, we were um, publicizing this. And I think La Voz is great. Um, also, I was just going to ask about Spanish language radio, because I know that for Spanish speaking you know, communities, right. um, radio is extremely important. So if there's an opportunity there and a budget, right. uh, that that would make sense. So we reached out to, La, I think it's La Bomba, mm -hmm. uh, which is the most common the most popular Spanish language radio station in this particular area. Um, we went back and forth a little bit, so we haven't gotten full responsiveness of what it would cost, like all those details, so it's on our radar, and we have reached out, and just we're not getting the loop closed a little bit on that one, but it is, we have reached out, and I think we will get there. Great. Yeah. So just uh, very quickly, I think one, one question and comment. Um, Additional question and comment. So the you mentioned moving back to the registration deadline, which makes all the sense in the world. I'm wondering if uh, you will be sending home information with families. Uh, so for Spanish-speaking families, I think you know a lot of the the relationships they'll be sharing information. So that might be an easy way to just say, hey, the registration deadline has moved, and you know if if you know folks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, we typically do outreach also to all the area preschools in addition to our current students um, to then share with their communities as well. Great. But yes. Um, and then I think the other comment that I had, just something that came to me when you were mentioning about uh, professional development, this this idea wouldn't take the place of professional development, but maybe a, a nice ad for folks who are moderate to fluent um, to maybe, as, as you know, the, the uh, Spanish language uh, community is being sort of built up in Fort River. Uh, to provide an opportunity for educators to, to maybe talk with those families and to share with them. I think uh, conversational opportunities are always extremely important for learning a second language or getting stronger in a second language. So again, not to take the place of, of PD, but you know that might be a great way for Spanish-speaking educators, some of whom even I'm not familiar with. Um, there's been a couple of folks that I've been surprised to hear, like, wow, you actually speak Spanish? I had no idea. Right. Um, but if they are able to sit in with some of those families, maybe informally, and have some conversations, you know, on a regular basis, that might help a lot as well. Uh, it'll help build relationships and it'll yeah. also help build the language skills. So, you know, and help the the families feel more engaged, like they've got something positive to contribute as well. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. just, you know. So, but otherwise, I agree. I think this is fantastic to get this much information about the work that's gone on there. Um, I think the way that you've been providing information throughout the past year has shown clearly that there's been a high level of engagement and thinking uh, about this. So I'm not surprised by all this uh, information, but it's still really helpful to have. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, okay, so moving us along, um, formats of school committee meetings. Yeah, I, th I think this was, a, as I remember in the last meeting, Mr. Demling started us in a conversation about format. Not to put all <laughs> attention, but yeah. That's how I remember it. Is this the, so this is about the idea of, uh, of having sort of formal meetings in town hall and then having some informal or sort of, yeah, I think I had raised that idea as, yeah. Oh, yeah. I apologize then. Yeah. yeah. So this is a comment that I had made uh, in response to the uh, Location of meetings. Yeah, yeah, no, I remember. Yeah. I, I was complimenting Ms. McDonald earlier for that comment. That yeah, idea. well, she yeah. had. Yeah. <laughs> I think I piled on. I don't think oh, okay. it was my original well, idea. Well, you're both great. <laughs> Collectively, the committee <laughs> came up with such a good topic. I sure we were <laughs> talking about this, the same thing. So, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Tumley. I'm no, sorry. I, 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 think we, I think we are, just yeah. in different. Yeah, yeah, so you originally brought it up under that idea when we were talking about location of meetings and said, oh, well, we could have different types of meetings here. And then that kind of related to like, so it's come up several other meetings, right? Mm -hmm. about. Um, the limitations of public comment and, you know, we had that, I thought, I thought it was a fairly positive experience at the very beginning of um, the Fort River School Building Committee mm -hmm. where we were just having public forums about what people wanted about the design of it. Uh, and it was a back and where we sort of set the table, gave some, something to pe pe people to react to, and then we had kind of a back and forth Q&A. And, um, and so after you had uh, mentioned that possibility of, um, well, what if we had different types of meetings back at the 
uh, the high school if we were at um, town hall. Just um, I was just sort of thinking through different you know permutations of that, and that wouldn't it be neat if we had like a, a series of those that were like somewhat regularly scheduled, like say they happen two or three times a year, where um, you didn't have to wait until a particular agenda item came up, and then you get three minutes, and then you. You don't, you don't get any response from the school committee. Um, where it was, oh, this is the fall Q&A, and so what's the update from the school committee? And so we, we do five, 10 minutes on what's going on, and then people could just ask. And, and it's, a, it's a public meeting, it's open, it's on, you know, published open meeting law and all that, uh, but it's a lot more dialogue-y, right, than, than public comment ever could be. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, I think we should have just coming out in two different places. I, I mean, I, I think it's a great idea. You know, I, I think uh, providing opportunities for the community to engage, um, you know, it's just my, my opinion. Um, I, I think having agendas, you know, is helpful, but also providing just some open space for folks to bring their, their thinking and their, you know, share their, their concerns uh, would also be helpful. I guess, you know, my, the only thing that, I, that I've thought about that I, I guess I'm a little bit concerned with or, or just would want to think about a little bit more is uh, just our, our staff time. So I think, Superintendent, you know, it's no secret that you go to other meetings in addition to <laughs> these meetings, um, other, you know, evening meetings and are obviously being pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, and, you know, and I think it's important just to, to raise it up out loud because it, this would be potentially adding some additional, you know, meetings, several, you know, long meetings to the course of the year. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. And then I think if it's an open meeting, you know, are we also taking minutes? Like, is there some other function for staff that we would have to be cognizant of? And not to say those are barriers, I think I could see actually maybe it would be beneficial to not have a superintendent at some of these meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the school committee listening um, and talking. Uh, similarly, I think, you know, maybe we could take turns keeping loose minutes or, you know, if it's recorded, you know, we could figure something else out. That's I don't know, but there could be some other options for that. But, you know. Yeah, so um, I appreciate you raising the, the concern, you know. Um, I don't have a great answer, um, a response to it, but I think my sense is that every now and then there's topical um, necessities to engage, and we might have embarked on one tonight. Um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that maybe at some point, you know, there's going to be some opportunity to do so. Um, I also just I put it as an I wonder, and I truly mean this, and I wonder if um, there are some times where public comment gets opened up in, in a traditional meeting, it turns into a little bit of a hybrid meeting. So in addition to sort of more open forums, there's topics where, you know, I just, example in one of the other districts I'm working in now where we're actively planned and have communicated, we are planning to have a meeting where in the course on a, on a particularly, um, an issue that's taking a lot of the community's interest or has a lot of the community's interest, we're gonna put a forum into the meeting. So yes, the committee is gonna discuss this matter um, and then there's a 45-minute session where it is more give and take, and it doesn't follow the more traditional rules of of, um, of of public comment. And you know, there's language in the policy manual that describes how that how that can function. So it's not to suggest that what people are interested in is a bad idea, but I also wonder, just from community interest, like sometimes it's really satisfying to hear the committee discuss something and then actually engage in dialogue as opposed to just having it more open-ended where, you know, a range of topics get spoken about and at the end it's kind of like lots of information gets shared, but where does it actually go? So I just, I, I don't know, it's just another way to think about how to, to, the same end, which is how do you engage people, how do you engage a community, how is there more give and take than in traditional business meetings? So just something else to think about. Um, so a couple of, you know, one, I mean, this is where my comment came in earlier that I think this is a particularly good topic if we're going to, I mean, I don't, look, maybe everyone will love being in town hall and, no, I'm saying the public, no, I don't mean us. And hopefully we'll like it too. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, you know, hopefully the public will it feel good about it, yeah. and it and it won't have a dynamic that'll seem to beg for opportunities to engage mm -hmm. in, in a more open setting, but also in the schools, ideally. Um, but I I like the idea of if we, when we're shooting for something simpler, twice a year maybe, like in the, once in the fall, once in the spring, um, doing a meeting in, I guess you can roll the dice in the elementary schools because they probably all want it and only two could get it, right? 
Um, and uh, I, I also like the idea of doing a hybrid where you look at the calendar of issues that are going on and just pick something that's particularly germane. That, there always, there's always going to be something, right? Um, where, we, where, where both the committee and the public could hear maybe a little bit more in-depth information, but then have some open dialogue and discussion and feedback, and then another part of the agenda that's just more open. So that if somebody comes, and they might like the topic that was being discussed more organized, but if not, they still have an opportunity for a minute or two to bring up some issue that's just acutely significant to them and really be heard and really have an interaction. And the reason I also say that is I think, um, for, for those of you who are familiar with this, and I know at least a couple of you are, um, if you have like community-based hearings, like HUD has a million of these, and city halls have a million of these. Mm -hmm. And so you start, because everyone agrees, community engagement is really important, <laughs> right? And so it starts out as a really nice idea, where at least for, you know, um, including Ms. Spitzer, the six of us all really think this is awesome and really on board. And then like two or three years from now, it's turned into this thing everyone does and just shows up to. And they don't, no one can feel comfortable killing it, even though like nobody shows up to it and no one's really interested in being there anymore. Um, but it feels like an obligation. To me, part of the way of avoiding that sort of dystopian outcome <laughs> is, is, is for the committee to think actively what would excite, what is exciting us? Mm -hmm. What are we digging into that's important? So that gives people a reason to show up because there's something topical, but then they still have an opportunity to engage more generally. Oh, that is such a good idea. I really like it. And so I, I think it complements well the idea of doing two versus three. Mm -hmm. Three is kind of like, okay, we're telling you the news, we're telling you the news. Two, it, it keeps it special and it keeps it, um, you know, it, 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 it makes you think about quality. And so you could have a combination where you had one featured topic, your hook topic, you know, this is going to get, people are going to come out for this specifically. They're going to give some little presentation about it. But then also a general update. Oh, while you're here to talk about this exciting thing, let us tell you about the assessment method, you know, or whatever it is. Not, not, not the Amherst assessment. <laughs> <laughs> Some other wonky, boring prop. <laughs> the Amherst you know. Pelham Elementary School assessment method. <laughs> 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 yes. um, but you know what I mean. And then yeah, so you have like uh, the you're hitting you're hitting both um, approaches. Yeah, I, I really like that. And I, I, I do. I, I, I wanted to mention at the top, you know, one of the definite cons is you know, not only superintendent and staff time, but, but school committee member time as well, where we would be signing up for this as well. I don't want to say that out loud. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I, th I think that combination could work really nice. Mm -hmm. I, I also love the idea of the hybrid meeting approach too. Mm -hmm. So, um, like having the hook, and, and I wonder if it could sort of weave its way into actually not being 100% incremental meetings. Mm -hmm. right? So I wonder if there's ones not this, you know, by sort of creative agenda formation, mm -hmm. <laughs> we could work it out so that it is maybe instead of adding two or three meetings in the year, we're adding one or two, and we sort of repurpose some of our meetings and have them out in the elementary schools. I, I like the idea of having two to make them feel special, but I do sort of, we should hold ourselves open to the idea that the third school may be begging us to come and, and be open to that, mm. because I don't want to pick favors. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Bye. Great. Um, well, so does it make sense in order to, because I'm hearing some, some enthusiasm from the committee about this idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, does it make sense for maybe for, for me and Dr. Morris to kind of put our heads together and think through if maybe there are some agendas, existing agendas that, you know, or, or uh, existing meetings that we can turn into those kind of joint meetings? Sure. Uh, and then think through what that might look like time-wise, and then bring that back to the committee, if that work. Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love for you for us to, you know, in the spirit of, like, testing things out, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> if, it, if it's workable on the schedule, you know, between now and the end of the year, for mm -hmm. us to yeah. get, like, you know, uh, one of these, you know, going yeah. in that location, that would be, that would be some, some good progress. Great. Okay, so we'll do that. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so moving along, Amherst Media uh, Mass Cultural Council support letter. So there's, there's a draft in your packet. Um, and this is also, I think, very brief item. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in my role as uh, liaison to Amherst Media, 
Um, I had heard from the executive director from Jim Lisco that um, that there was a application being put forth to the Massachusetts Cultural Council for grant money that actually comes from their capital fund, uh, which would potentially, if they get it, would help them uh, towards their goal of building a new building. And I think, as all of you know, uh, Amherst Media has been uh, raising funds for a little while now to try to collect the money to, to build this new building. Um, and they are getting there, slowly but surely. Um, but they could use some help, and I think this is a substantial grant. Um, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's it's uh, enough of a, of a dent over in six figures that would actually help, uh, you know, make a sizable uh, dent in their capital campaign. So um, I had spoken with Mr. Lesko. He had uh, given me some thoughts about uh, you know some <coughs> of the ways that Amherst Media benefits the schools that we could potentially react to because they are looking for support from various community voices and a, vo a letter of support coming from the school committee that they could include in their application to the Mass Cultural Council could really help them kind of get over the edge and actually get this grant. So I thought um, I would draft something, bring it to the committee for your feedback, uh, thoughts. If you hate it, we don't have to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But again, you know, recognizing the value that Amherst Media brings, um, I tried to include some examples here of some of their programming, mm -hmm. um, as well as just the role that they play in the community a little bit more um, uh, broadly. And uh, welcome your thoughts on whether this is a good idea and if there's any additional edits that you would like to make. Mr. Nakajima. Uh, so I think it's a good idea. Um, I feel jealous that I've apparently missed the curious draft. Because <laughs> um, it's it's online. You can is it actually really yes, it yes. is. You can actually I, get I it online. I honestly, I'm going to go on. And see something, it's, it's quite adorable. Yeah. Because if it's got a curious draft in it, which I'm assuming they're not misleading advertising, uh, then uh, you, you can't go wrong with that. No, but in all seriousness, I appreciate that being put in there. Because in all seriousness. Um, we, if you frame it out as a lot of the sort of civic virtue stuff, mm -hmm. like uh, like I really appreciate the fact that there are people who are going to watch me hearing me these comments, and uh, God bless you for doing so, and I appreciate all your feedback. Um, but and something like this, the fact that there are um, young people who get amazing opportunities to to learn and do hands-on media work, and that there's also programming that helps to really engage and connect. Um, residents of our town with our schools on a programmatic level as well as also a governance level is just really wonderful. It's worth supporting. Thank you. Mr. Um, yeah, It's also, yeah, I, I fully agree it's a wonderful idea. I, I was also going to mention the Curious Giraffe show. And I'm glad it's bringing it's a smile on my face because I'm about to get upset about the next topic. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it, it, it is, it's amazing. We just take it for granted. You know, so many people yes. in town just take it for granted. They think it's, it's just, oh, it's just part of public service that we get, how do we get that? And just, it's just there. Um, I, I talked to so many other community uh, people from across the state. I'm like, oh, how do you, do people watch your school committee meetings? And like, what do you mean watch the school committee meeting? You know, they're, they're not recorded and then it's, it's such a barrier to engagement. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about some of the digital evolutions with meetings being available online and that's how people are accessing technology. It's just, it's great. So it's a great public service. And I'm very happy to support it. Great, thank and you. I think it's a wonderful letter. You did a great job. Thank you. Uh, everything that's been said. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima? I move we uh, support the uh, draft as presented. Second. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? All those in favor? Excellent. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, so I will dig up a name to be the recipient for <laughs> this letter. Wait, and, I meant my uh, motion to be, it's supposed to be sent to dear name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, uh, I was gonna say something about that, but, um, so I will I will dig up a name for this uh, and then take, take the draft off, obviously add a date and uh, send it along. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next item is fund our future resolution. Um, Mr. Dumling, do you wanna take this one? Sure, so um, we should be familiar with this. We, we already did this at the regional level. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of you watching at home, this is essentially, what, it's the story that everybody should know by this point, which is public education in Massachusetts is 
grotesquely underfunded. Uh, Two billion is, is an easy estimate, and the hardest hit communities in our state are the poorest communities. Because what happens is that when your basic foundation for education, and we're talking about, it's called the foundation budget for a reason. It's supposed to be your foundational expenses, right? Healthcare, special ed, uh, resources for low income students, for English language learners, these are like the big, the big pieces, and it's <coughs> severely underfunded. So what happens is that the state underfunds that, and it's left to municipalities, it's, le it's left to communities to, to fork over. And so if you are willing and able to do that as a municipality, then you get better funded schools. If you, are, if you want to do that, but you don't have the economic means, then you can't, and schools suffer. And we have such a, a, it's an indescribable level of income inequality in our state. And, you know, I mean, specific for Amherst, you're like, yes, we will get money for this. Even at a conservative estimate, there's a, so it's called Fund, Fund Our Future campaign. You can write in your town and it'll give you an estimate of what, what this would mean if they updated the foundation budget to, to, to modernize it. Um, and this has all been studied. This is Foundation Budget Review Commission. This is very well documented. This isn't just teachers and schools asking for money. Um, so Amherst would get 265 thousand dollars a year, which which is no small chunk of change. We could definitely do a lot with that. Um, Holyoke will get twenty million dollars a year. Springfield would get ninety five million. Ninety five million dollars a year to Springfield. And and why should kids in Springfield because of the zip code that they live in, the, the, the real estate values of their neighborhood have a less funded education than kids in Amherst or Newton or Wellesley? And and it's 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 unconscious it's un it's unbelievable and it's it's as, as much as, as fired up as I get about charter schools, <laughs> um, and 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 you know that's another legitimate issue to get fired up about. I get more upset about this because it's so hard to describe to people in our state that we are not a progressive state when it comes to funding education and other core public services. And this is the 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 fundamental example of it. So this is. You know, yes, this is good for our community. I'm, I'm, I'm glad this will have benefit to Amherst. Um, but it's, it's a social justice issue. It's about income inequality. It's about holding not just the Republican governor, but our Democratic leadership in the House that has completely dropped the ball on this issue for years accountable. Um, and, and helping the MTA and the Mass State Justice Alliance and the rest of these grassroots organizations that are fighting many millions of dollars against um, because cause what, this, what this does, you know, when you, when you pass legislation that demands this funding, you've got to find the funding for it. And the state it has a revenue crisis in terms of not having enough funding. And part of that is because the state income tax has decreased over the last 10 years, and it begs the question, shouldn't we have a progressive income tax? And that's why you have people fighting this on the side. So it, it, all, it all comes back to money. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just happy that we can do something in this fight for, for income inequality in the state of Massachusetts. I think it's very well said, Mr. Demling, and I also say that uh, just to you know to add and to clarify that uh, there are other similar resolutions, not just the one that we passed at the regional level, but across the state. Uh, and so I think the the basic strategy is to show support from school districts across the state uh, for the sentiments expressed in this resolution, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully that sends a very strong message to our state leadership that this is ma that matters to us. Uh, it matters to our schools and that we really need them to take action on this. And again, you know, we have, Mr. Dumley and I have met with, uh, and I'm sure many of us on this, um, sitting on this table, have met with uh, various state elected representatives in recent years on a whole bunch of different things related to regional transportation, charter schools, and et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, our leadership continues to express support for these ideas, but when push comes to shove, we find that the, the politics and the will just isn't there. So I think anything that we can do to help support that, um, those sentiments, make sure that we're sending that strong message, um, the better off we all are. So I will take a motion for, unless Mr. Nagajima, do you have something else you want to add? Or was you, would you mind I to? Move. Excellent. The uh, Amherst uh, School Committee support the resolution in support of full funding for Massachusetts public schools. You want to read it? Sure. Whereas free public schools available to all students without exception are foundational to our democracy and are required by the state constitution, and whereas all of our students, no matter where they live, deserve high quality public schools that teach the whole child and provide them with a rich school experience that addresses their academic, social, and emotional needs, whereas the state's foundation budget formula 
which determines state aid to each district, has been woefully out of date for years, thereby underfunding our districts by more than $1 billion a year for essential educational services, and whereas an updated foundation budget formula would bring the Amherst School District additional state aid each year, allowing this district to move closer to providing all students with the education to which they are entitled as residents of the Commonwealth, and whereas the legislature failed to pass any foundation budget legislation in the last session, leaving districts, educators, and students without the funds necessary to support the schools our students deserve in every district in the state. Therefore, be it resolved that the Amherst School District urges the legislature to approve and fully fund a new foundation budget formula by May 1, 2019, signed on behalf of the Amherst School Committee, uh, Anastasia Rodonis, Chair and School Committee. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any further comments or questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Resolution is passed. Thank you very much. So um, it looks like there should be a signature on this. <laughs> Ms. Westmoreland, uh, is there a, maybe we can get a clean copy that we could yes. send I'm along? I'm sorry, I should have brought one. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, I can yes, come later this week. Yeah. I was going to also offer if you want the letter for Amherst Media to be on letterhead. That'd be great. If you'll send the, the final text Will to do. me after that. Thank you. Okay, uh, so moving along, the next item on the agenda is gifts, but we don't have any gifts tonight. No, gifts. no, no gifts tonight. Okay, next time. Um, school committee planning. So I have for the seventh, you know, loosely titled for now, MSPA statement of interest process. You know, but we'll get a bit of language working with the chair. Yeah. 22nd. Um, I've got a lot, um, so it's I've got the ADA audit, which is going to be a joint meeting of the multiple committees with the consultant coming out. Um, uh, I think we'll still be talking about that SOI process on the 22nd. Um, sabbatical, we did a sabbatical request in the Amherst Public Schools, consideration of that. Capital, um, some information about the registration onboarding process uh, was asked for. We have a bunch of budget guidance discussions, mm -hmm. dual language lottery system, and then initial budget projections. Mr. Dunling? Is, is that capital item going to be pretty in depth? I'm just like thinking about um, you know community attention. If we're really ramping up on the uh, the SOI process, people are going to be thinking about yeah. capital needs and whatnot, and so yeah. So what we can do and what we loosely talked about is just sharing all the backup data that people were asking about. It's going to be, to use your word, a lot of spreadsheets and wonky stuff. Um, our new facilities director doesn't start until later that week, so he won't be there to present it, which is, you know, a bit unfortunate, but I don't think the timeline could change on that. Um, just in terms of where the data came from, um, what the projections, and really focusing on the next fiscal year, not as much mm -hmm. five years down the road, but in terms of the fiscal recommendations or requests and you know we've gotten some feedback from committee members from community members so we may make some adjustments from what you saw in November but um, that's the type of uh, information we were planning to bring Great. Well, this sounds right to me um, and we'll meet later on just to finalize the agenda okay any other Issues or comments for the superintendent or for me about uh, planning? It would be nice to see. Um, did, I know we did this at the region level. Have we done like a, a looking out a few meetings at topics we know are going to come up? We sort of an exercise. Have for not, the, the not, not project? for the. But we can certainly do that. I think that might make sense. I mean, yeah. it might make sense because the question I don't want to ask now, and I'm totally not asking right now, is like if that's what we're doing on the 22nd, and it's filled with lots of really cool, important stuff. I wonder what's on the, the next likely one. to be on the next agenda, <laughs> and I'd rather just get that in my email inbox and read mm -hmm. it, and then we can talk about it later. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. That makes sense, Mr. Demling. E either so it's we're going to have to play it by ear with timing, but at some point the commissioner is going to rule on the charter school expansion. Mm -hmm. um, and then pretty soon after that, there'll be a one of the um, uh, Board of Ed's meetings um, in which, for so the last couple of years, has kind of been a last minute opportunity to provide additional feedback and then talk about, you know, planning and or presenting mm -hmm. and such. So um, hard to say at this date whether that should be on the 22nd, but we'll probably just have to wait until the last minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be a quick item that we just an update. Yeah, I yeah, no. I think that makes sense. Great. Okay. Um, Mr. Dunlin? I'm sorry. Um, 
So at that point, we'll have the regional planning board will have had the financial consultant report back. Do you want that on the twenty second or the? I think that makes sense. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. given where we are with the conversation, okay. but um, why don't you keep us posted on what comes back? Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, and just Mr. just to put a fine. No, I, I'm trying not trying to extend the meeting. <laughs> no, someone right. might logically ask about Fort River feasibility. Yeah. You know, and whether the January twenty second date or the February meeting is better um uh based on the number of things you just listed yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i'm having a hard time imagining how we're going to deal with it on the 22nd um i think we'd probably be ready by then but i think it's up to I me mean, when when's the one in february is it soon in february or another the month i away? can tell you in one second i think it is the 12th 12th doesn't sound terribly nope. bad i'm sorry i was wrong uh, no, it's the 26th, actually. So it needs to be yeah, on the 22nd. Be, it's 22nd. <laughs> yeah. Simple. I think we can look at some of these items. So there, there is a long list of items, but I think some of these we can move through fairly mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah, I think it's the budget guidance that actually I'm most concerned about. I am too. Um, not because it's not worthy, it's just that, you know, when we have encouraged staff to come and make presentations, it's hard to... It's important. Yeah, it's yeah. important. You know, I think yeah. we need to have that. Right. But it would just a matter of making time for, yeah. for these. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We could start our meeting at 5.30, or not. We could do that. We just got to look at the Game. We could do that. OK. Uh, I will take a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.